You know it's this. Take a perk and talk it and see. Money swallowing like six. Did it perfect to the kid. Got a million who's single, my hate and nothing better. Put on the road, I just win. I know we got a million dollars, the devil that's it, and I chip it again. Hello and welcome back, fellow anime lovers, to Manga Muse. I am delighted to have you join us once again in the world of fanfiction and fantasy. This is the second part of What If Deku Enters Young Justice. Special note, this fanfic is written in a masterpiece of Sajirox Tenkin on fanfiction.net. Do check and support the author too. Now smash the like, share and subscribe button for more. Also press the bell icon so that you never miss such great parts. Thanks for the introduction. Now let's dive into the world. Flashback end. Shaking himself out of his thoughts, Jack started to follow a cult through the doors into Grant's gym. The place was very spacious and had all the amenities you could find at any other gym from weight machines to free weights, cardio machines, and all other manner of basic workout equipment. However, one big difference was that at the far back of the gym before the back exit, there was a massive area sectioned off for a wooden floor for yoga, a massive boxing ring, and even a steel octagon cage. Walking in between all of the gear and heading back to the area where the fighting section of the gym was, Jack could see a wall that was covered in posters next to a line of three windows with their white blinds slightly tinted which no doubt led into an office of some kind. Upon closer inspection Jack could see the names of the fighters on the posters and every single one had one thing in common. Ted Grant's name was on the poster as one of the competitors for the main event of every single one. Ted had obviously competed against great opponents his whole life and even had two separate sets of three posters detailing title fights against the likes of Jack Dempsey and Joe Louis. Jack had been a fan of boxing, MMA, and even WWE though he rarely mentioned that back in his previous life and knew both of the names of the men that Ted had apparently fought and even defeated if the posters were anything to go by. Before you ask, yeah I fought those boys, let me tell you something Dempsey was a mean son of a gun, and I still till this day haven't fought anybody with a better right hook than Louie, and as you can imagine that's pretty serious considering some of the bums and lowlifes I've come across. Jack turned to face the voice and immediately knew who he was looking at. He recognized the large but obviously muscular frame underneath a basic white t-shirt, pair of blue jeans, and black trainers. The guy had to be at least 6'2 or 6'3 and if he was doing a comparison he'd say that Ted Grant could easily have given All Might a run for his money in the size department if they were to stand next to each other to compare. The man had a very grizzled yet unblemished face, dark sharp eyes, a full head of hair though now all of the hair was a slightly silver color, and one of the squarest jaws Jack had ever seen. Ted's arms were a thing to behold with his biceps looking almost half the size of a typical person's thigh though his arms were obviously far more defined. His chest was almost as broad-looking as his shoulders, and if Jack had to guess the guy was absolutely solid. Hey Richard, this kid gonna start drooling on my floor, cause he's gonna clean it up if that's the case. The statement was made amiably enough as Ted approached the duo and proceeded to pull a cult into a mild hug with a few large pats on the back. Meanwhile, Jack attempted to rid his face of the burning feeling from being teased by the older hero. Rich you sneaky devil I haven't seen you in forever. How you been huh? Hope you been keeping yourself healthy. I'd hate to have to kick your butt after not seeing you for what it's been about six years now. Grant said with his right hand on a cult's shoulder as he peered at the man underneath his hat. Yes it has been some time hasn't it Ted? It's good to see you old friend and I am glad you're looking well. As I said when I spoke to you on the phone yesterday, this is the young man I wanted to introduce you to. Could we perhaps take a seat in your office and discuss a few things? Occult said as Ted released his grip on his shoulder to take a quick glance around the gym. The place seemed a little empty considering it was about 9 am and back on his original earth when Jack had been a member of Retro Fitness, the place tended to be pretty busy around that time, with people coming and going for either spin classes or the HIIT training classes. Right now there seemed to be only a few people on the cardio machines scattered about the place. Two older gentlemen at the free weights, and one girl who had to be around Jack's age, not too far from the three men viciously attacking a heavy bag with a barrage of kicks and punches alike. Yeah sure the place is looking kinda dead right now anyway, besides there's only one real knucklehead in here right now anyway, and nobody that's here would dare take a shot at her after what she did to one of my regulars, Mad Dog Grimes. 
Hey Helena, keep an eye on the place, would ya? I got some business I gotta take care of. Ted screamed over to the young girl as he turned waving as he went gesturing for the two to follow him into the office. Jack heard a few deep breaths as he turned to follow the two veterans and heard a muttered, sure thing from the girl as she started to take off her dark hand wraps. Jack briefly had a sense of deja vu as he glanced back a caught a look at the girl as she turned to walk away. She looked to be about 5'3 maybe 5'4 with a light olive complexion. Her long dark hair was tied into a tight ponytail and bunched up at the middle so that it was folded in on itself, keeping what he had to estimate was about slightly past shoulder-length hair out of the way for her workout. From this distance he couldn't tell if she had a lot of definition outside of her back muscles, but watching her walk he knew one thing. She had great control of her body. Her steps were fluid and she had no stagger so she was either a dancer, a gymnast, a martial artist probably more so or maybe even a combination of the three because she had great control of her body. Her dark sports bra clung to her body and framed her defined back and her dark baggy sweatpants were taut against her hips showing off a vague hint of her bottom half's curves. The name flashed through his mind again and he immediately knew who he was most probably dealing with, though he would have to meet and talk with her before he had confirmation. Though if Jack was right and he was willing to bet he was that, was Helena Bertinelli a.k.a. the Huntress. Jack had been a big fan of heroes his whole life and Justice League Unlimited had been a fantastic show for him growing up. He enjoyed all of the characters and had been introduced to many hero heroines he had never heard of before because of it. One of the main ones being the Huntress. Helena Bertinelli had a tragic backstory her father was a criminal and one of his underlings had killed him and his wife, while a young Helena had been forced to quietly watch, hoping not to be discovered and share the same fate. Whether or not this was her he would find out, though it did strike him as odd considering that in the JLU universe Helena had been a full-fledged adult not a run-of-the-mill teenager. You gonna ogle my student all day, or are you gonna get your butt in here newbie I ain't gonna live forever? Ted yelled from the office quickly taking Jack's attention back to the meeting he should be having making him dash into the office where a cult shut the door for privacy. Jack never noticed the dark eyes watching him as he slipped into the office. The office was rather plain, white walls, brown hardwood floor, and a small smattering of furniture leaving it almost completely lacking in decoration, except for the back wall where there were two cabinets. Hanging above each cabinet was a golden belt, each signifying the victory that Ted had garnered having been the world's heavyweight champion. Beneath the belts in the brown cabinets behind glass panes were dozens of pictures of Ted with an assortment of other people. Pictures ranging from his pre-fight interviews with his competition to celebrities like Marilyn Monroe of all people. Ted must have caught Jack staring again as he sat behind his metal double pedestal steel desk because he turned slightly in his black swivel chair to look at the cases with Jack, while Richard sat on a brown leather couch that was against the back wall near the door with his hands neatly folded in his lap. She was an absolute sweetheart, let me tell ya, one of the nicest dames I ever met really. Contrary to popular belief, she was also not stupid, not at all. Ted said with a slight smile on his face, his eyes looking slightly lost in memory. Wish I coulda held on to her, I coulda probably helped her, kept her safe. But what are you gonna do right? Things happen, people die. That's enough reminiscing. To avoid any more distractions let's get right to it. Richard explained some of your situation on the phone. I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but it's like this. I'm retired from the hero gig have been for a long time, and I got no reason whatsoever to get myself involved in training some punk with meta powers. I'm betting you think you're real special Doncha Jr.? The sarcasm and scorn had rolled off of every word of that statement and made Jack feel like he'd been gut-punched. The tirade came and went in the blink of an eye, and while most would have been surprised or maybe even angry Jack had expected it, though that didn't make it any easier to digest. The man sitting before him was just a normal guy, a peak of physical human condition guy who had had his aging process retarded and had to be killed nine consecutive times to stay dead, but still a guy all the same. Ted Grant had loved and lost, and even fought and lost. Of course he would do this to try and throw him off right on the jump, but Jack wasn't gonna fall for this ploy. Ted wasn't looking to tie anybody into this life. 
Jack could tell that while Ted's memories of his time as a hero were mostly good the picture of him and the JSA in the upper right-hand cabinet being all the proof he would need for that line of thought, he could also see in the man's eyes the need to caution Jack. He wasn't gonna just let somebody walk into the hero life without knowing what they were in for. The rebuke wasn't about Ted not wanting him to be a hero at least Jack hoped not know it was about taking the measure of Jack and seeing if he truly understood what it meant to get into this kind of life. Jack had no delusions about it. All the media, the comics, the shows, the movies, all of it from any universe had painted the picture of the life of a superhero and it almost always ended in tragedy or was at least mired in it. This was Ted asking if Jack thought he could really handle it. Because once you got on this train and really started moving, there was really no way off of it, not without consequences anyway. Hopefully this doesn't make me sound too full of it or get me knocked the heck out. Jack took a deep breath and then started on what he hoped would be the speech that would start his hero career. How about this, me and you go for one round, cause the way I see it you'll know within about 10-15 seconds whether or not I can cut it in a fight in this life. We do two sets after this place closes. One with me with no powers at all, and the other with me going at the best I think I can handle right now. If by the time it's all over you think I can't hack it I'll walk no hard feelings, but if you even think there's the slightest chance I can do some good you help get me up to snuff. Look I didn't ask for this hell part of me doesn't even want it for a lot of reasons the main one being I wanna go home, I miss my family, I don't know if a cult told you, but I'm not exactly from around here. And I sure as hell shouldn't look like I can be friends with young Justin Bieber, but here we are. I'm scared out of my mind for a lot of reasons, but more than anything I know that while I'm here and while I've got this power I have to use it to do some kind of good. I made a promise to a great man that was on his deathbed that I would do the best I could to save people. So you can either help me or just tell me to take a hike, but don't try to play any mind games with me. We don't have time to mess around sir, so what's it gonna be? By the time Jack's speech ended it was hard to tell if Ted's eyebrows had merged with his hairline or not. And though he couldn't see it a cult had his head tilted down with his hat covering his face, concealing a wide smile. It started out soft but quickly came out. All it took was one chuckle that then turned into a full-blown belly laugh. It carried on for about a minute and once it had started Jack's face pinched into a scowl as his fists tightened at his sides. If this guy thinks for one minute, any kind of outburst Jack was gonna have died once he noticed Ted's change in countenance from jovial to serious. Okay kid, that was a pretty impressive speech I'm not gonna lie. I'll tell you right now I like that fire in your eyes. That determination right there is what you're gonna need to get through the hell I plan to put you through. Your 14 so weight training while not exactly great for you at this stage is gonna be a pretty big benchmark for your training with me besides the beatdowns I may give ya. Make no mistake that challenge is accepted, but not right now. Rich says you definitely have some martial skill, and we'll get to that I promise. Jack was completely shocked when the man looked up at him with a very serious glint in his eye, his hands folded in front of him on the cherry wood of the desk, though Jack swore he could also see some pride mixed in. It kinder reminded him of his dad. First things first, Ima put you through the ringer to get your body in peak shape and then you're gonna show me what this power is that you got because according to Rich it's massive and unreal for a human. But we're just gonna let me be the judge of that. I live upstairs so now so do you. You'll be bunking here with me from now on. From 0530M to 0730M every morning for the next six months you better not even try to swear to God because you're gonna be swearing to me. Your as is mine plain and simple. Let me make myself clear as crystal right here and now. I give an order you best follow it. No ifs no ends and no buts. I don't want to hear a word of complaint out of ya unless it's about actual body pain, and I mean the kind that means something's sprained or broken. You will not, and I repeat, you will not even ask about going on a patrol until the six months are up. I don't care if the goddamn gym itself spontaneously combusts your ass will act as a civilian, and you will evacuate like anybody else. There are other rules that we'll go over as times goes by but for now that we'll do as an introduction. From 0830 until 1530 sharp you will be working in this gym, from sweeping up, to re-racking weights, to scrubbing toilets. If you're going to live here, train here, and eat here, you're gonna earn your keep. 
For the rest of today me you and Trenchcoat Maji over here are gonna talk about you. Get a bead on what you're capable of from my perspective, and then we're gonna go see this friend of his to square away your identity. Now I don't know just where and when it is you come from, but I'm sure as hell not gonna let you go out into this world without at least knowing a little bit about you and seeing what you know and how it compares to here so you don't seem like a nutcase so get ready to spill your guts kid cause we got work to do. Jack slowly released a breathe he had been holding in and stood as he saw Ted getting to his feet. Ted extended his hand above and across the desk with the same fire from before in his eyes, looking to see if Jack would back down. Well I'm sure as hell not gonna disappoint the old timer. It's an honor, and I promise you I'll give my best every day sir. Jack said as he clasped hands with the legend standing before him. Ted's genuine smile became something a little off as it switched to a smirk, and he quickly began to add more pressure to the handshake, hoping to shake the young man up and make him wince. But Jack wouldn't be deterred. Quickly summoning up the 2% of one for all he squeezed back and attempted to match the output that Ted was now putting on his hand. Ted's eyes got a little wider at the light green sparks dancing around Jack but then tapered off the pressure of the handshake for something a little more consistent as the smirk then shifted into more of an excited grin. I got a feeling knowing you is gonna be an exciting ride, kid. Gotham City September 6, 1330 EST The following couple hours had been interesting to say the least for Jackson as he brought his new trainer mentor up to speed about his circumstances. To say that Ted was shocked to find Jack was from another Earth would have been a disservice to his reaction in of itself. Jack had immediately told Ted where he came from after they finished shaking hands, and once it dawned on Ted that Jack wasn't messing with him, he just sort of collapsed into his swivel chair. Jack would have been lying if he said he hadn't taken the smallest bit of pleasure in surprising the great fighter before him. As Jack went to reveal the rest of his story, Ted simply sat back with a very pensive look on his face as time passed while Jack told his tale. Over time a cult had risen from the couch and had procured a couple of bottled waters for the three of them from the mini fridge beside Ted's desk. As he passed the water to Jack they shared an almost imperceptible nod. Before having transported himself and Jack both to the alley next to Ted's gym Jack and a cult had talked at length about how much was viable to share with Ted, even though he was most probably going to remain a large part of Jackson's network Richard had his reservations. A cult had many times impressed upon Jack how important it was for the information that he was in fact from a parallel earth to remain in as small a circle as possible, though for each time he attempted to dissuade Jack from telling his old friend the truth. Jack would simply state how important transparency was for them going forward with this venture, at the very least where Ted was concerned. Jack had stated that if he was going to receive training and lodging from the man that he wouldn't put himself in a position where he had to lie or keep secrets from Ted. A cult had immediately berated Jack saying that he didn't know Ted and that because of that fact he didn't owe him that kind of loyalty yet, but Jack stated that it was simply the right thing to do and that to do otherwise was obscenely disrespectful to Ted and went against his own morals. Jack remembered talking with a cult and how every time it had come to the very specific topic of talking to Ted, that Richard had almost been adamant that they not share the information of parallel earths with him. This direct opposition that a cult was showing, and not that he was showing it in general, but to someone that he himself had said was a good friend was troubling to Jack. How good of friends could Ted and Richard actually be if he wanted to outright deny Ted access to the origin of the person that Richard had basically thrown in his lap to train? Let it be known that Jack did not hold himself on any kind of pedestal. Jack had done many things in life that he regretted from lying to stealing, and even some of his own fights were on the list of things that he had come to hold disappointment in himself for. Life is difficult and sometimes choices have to be made. With that being said Jack quite clearly remembered making more than a few out of emotion and that usually led to something bad. But Jack had grown and many of those things had been done when he was about the age he was now again. And he refused to make any of those same mistakes again if he could help it. The biggest of them being lying to anyone that was important to him. Ted was gonna be kind of important. Jack fortunately though had whittled Richard down and made it abundantly clear that he and Ted were the only two people he planned on sharing his true origin story with. Richard of course acquiesced with this, stating that Jack had the right of it even though it made him terribly nervous to have the information even that spread out. 
apparently a cult knew for a fact that only about a dozen or so people knew for a fact that interdimensional travel through the multiverse was possible and had tried to do anything about it. And only three of them had apparently had contact of any kind once they understood what they were doing. A cult had gone on to explain that with the understanding that it was possible to travel between the Earths of the multiverse, to do so put a massive target upon not only one's back but one's home. That statement alone had almost set Jack into a panic attack. Three worlds could possibly now hang in the balance with his and All Might's arrival to this Earth, though sensing his train of thought occult had been quick to dissuade him of any frightening thoughts. Occult in a very short, completely roundabout, and quite frankly insulting way had explained that the unknown force that had caused this whole mess to begin with had seemingly covered its own tracks. That of course had led to another short conversation regarding the Endless, which ended with a very simple, put them out of your mind. We don't need you drawing any more attention from those kinds of beings. Jack of course understood why completely. Death. He had seen death her, and that shouldn't evoke any kinds of good feelings hard stop. The fact of it was simple. You don't go poking your nose into the business of beings that are as old as time itself. Jack didn't even know which iteration of the DC universe he was currently in, but talking about that group of primordial entities would most probably lead to nothing but large headaches or an unfortunate end whichever came first. Well, that certainly adds more issues to the mix of trying to make contingencies for future problems. Not to mention the fact of even being able to try and implement anything anyway when I can't talk to anyone about it. Richard had firmly put to bed any real chance Jack hoped for when it came to sharing specifics about possible dangers of this or any universe. Any plans you hope to implement you cannot share with me, simply based on the grounds that if I am ever taken captive or if I was to die and someone was to raid my memories, they would eventually uncover all of it. Very soon after we have established you with Ted, I will be using a spell upon myself to modify what I know of you directly. I will still be an ally and will always be at your disposal, but I cannot risk any of the more mystical entities that I come into contact with gaining even the basis of your origin, it would leave far too much to chance. Bringing himself back to the present, Jack looked up to see Ted nursing the water that he had as he seemed to be slowly digesting everything that he had been told about his future charge and what he was hoping to do. Ted briefly stood from his swivel chair to peek through the blinds out at the gym for the first time since Jack had begun his tale. The large man was rubbing his chin while raking his opposite hand through his short hair. It seemed that the whole thing had left him a bit shell-shocked. After sitting back down Ted looked right at Jack again with his penetrating eyes, looking just a little wearier than he had moments earlier. And of course why wouldn't he wouldn't you after all that? Sai, I gotta tell ya this whole thing has got my head twisted up. Make no mistake what I said earlier stands, it may train you up. But man if isn't all just a little overwhelming. Essentially I'm just a simple business owner at this point, have been that, and just about only that for years now. Not to mention the more mystical stuff usually only came about when I was around the rest of the JSA, and even then it was nothing like this. I'm sorry for what happened to you Jack, I really am. I need you to know that. While Rich is looking for a way home for you, if there is one you are obviously welcome to stay with me as long as you need. The offer was made kindly with a lot of sincerity and made Jack's chest tighten. It made him feel good to know that these two men had his back. The fact that they did at all made them bigger heroes than he already knew they were. What was that line again? A hero can be anyone even a man doing something as simple and reassuring as putting a coat around a young boy's shoulders to let him know the world hadn't ended. Sue him if you wanted but Jack found the thought apropos. I'm not ragging on either of you when I say this but damn it Rich. Next time you plan on not visiting with a few years in between the last visit you better at least bring a bottle of bourbon as a thank you. Well anyway like my daddy used to say no time like the present. I'll get my coat the rest of my staff should be here by now. I'm gonna dismiss Helena for the rest of the day and we'll take that trip and get you set up kid." Ted said as he stood and grabbed a black leather coat off the rack next to the door as he started to make his way out of the office with a colt close to him talking softly about the next destination they would visit. The three of them stepped out onto the gym floor and began to make their way toward the front of the building. The gym had about 40 or so patrons in it now, and if Jack had to take a stab he'd say the building was at about a quarter of its capacity now. 
he looked up to notice that they were almost out the door and could see Ted had his hand on Helena's shoulder as he was telling her that she was good to go for the day. The girl gave a small nod and turned to walk towards the back to head for the locker rooms. In passing he caught a glimpse of her face and that had been all he'd needed. She was definitely like the one from the JLU universe. The eyes are the windows to the soul, it was said, and Helena spoke of pain, deep-seated and terrible pain. Jack knew how that felt, quoting a favorite line in his own mind, it came unbidden pain is an old friend. Jack had to release a small shudder as they exited the gym. He had glimpsed her face and she hadn't even looked at him at all. Her thousand-yard stare was impressive as all get out, and if he was right at all there was only two different things she could be looking at. Her deceased family, or Stephen Mandragora. He hated himself for the need to ask, but it was there, and he needed to know. He needed to know, because this would tell him if he was in the JLU verse or something close to it, and that would give him a bit of a leg up on possible future threats. He couldn't necessarily tell Ted, but he could confide in a cult and plot out something to at the very least mitigate any possible future damage regardless of what Richard has said before. As they walked more towards the center of downtown, while wondering where they were headed Jack asked his new mentor. Out of curiosity, who's the girl Ted, a niece or just some girl that works for you? You look like she means a lot to you. He got a quick glance back, but then Ted turned back round to keep walking though Jack swore he had seen a smirk on Ted's face. Nah we're not related at all, but let me make it clear now don't you go making eyes at her kid. Helena's had a rough go. She's a sweet kid once she warms up to ya. She lives at the shelter down the block from the gym, been coming in for the past year or so now. Her daddy was a big-time scumbag if I'm being honest, but he was her father. Some mook who worked for M got tired of being his beach boy I guess, she don't talk about it much and I sure as hell ain't about to press. She's got a nice little bankroll and thinks she paying me to train her, Real thing about it is I can't in good conscience take her money so I've been holding it in a shoebox and come her birthday I'll buy her something with it. She's a good kid. Jack could hear it in Ted's inflection. He cared about Helena deeply. He probably figured out who she was right from the jump if she didn't offer it up herself, so that made Jack reluctant to ask any more on it. He didn't want to seem like a busy body and the answer alone had told him all he needed. Jack quickly dropped that line of questioning and thought and double-timed it over to the two men as where they were headed turned out was not too far at all. Six blocks and two right turns away from the gym and they were standing outside of an apartment complex. The red brick building looked a little worn but obviously not so bad that it wasn't still in use. Richard quickly ushered Ted and Jack both up the stoop and through the thick glass pane double doors. The brown hardwood floor inside was weathered and creaked viciously, almost as if it would break from the company of three standing on it as they began to walk down the hall they had found themselves in. The walls were of a similar color to the red brick of the building, the hallway having only doors with numbers on it until you reached halfway through it to an elevator with an exit door at the opposite end of the hallway. The group entered said elevator and Richard pressed the number six on the listing for the 14-floor building. As the elevator rose Ted and Jack continued as they had since leaving the gym, talking about Jack's knowledge of his home and how it differed from this one besides the fact that supers were running around. Jack made it quite clear that he was not a student of history and gave some vague answers about events that had happened back on his earth and was ashamed to admit that he didn't really remember a lot about past presidents, dates of important events, or etc. What he did remember though seemed to line up right so fate was on his side with that one at the very least. Thankfully Ted just chuckled as they talked while the elevator took its very slow ride up as he explained that Jack's lack of memory in regards to that was fine, as all it did was leave room for them to help him remember things about this earth so that if it ever came up in conversation with anyone he wouldn't come off as foolish or illiterate. Ted again tried to press about Jack going to school but was summarily shot down. No way in hell am I sitting through school again, no sir. The elevator ride other than that had been slow, and if Jack was being honest he was thankful for the distraction of the conversation because the elevator had no music, would shudder every few seconds, and if he was being frank about it, the thing smelled like a dumpster. The ding of the elevator couldn't have come sooner, and the three walked following Richard's lead out to the left down the hall towards the very end where the brown doors were farther apart signaling bigger flats until they reached the very end of the hall. 
Richard turned and knocked on the only door in the hall that seemed to have a glass pane on it, though it was completely glossed out showing that it was a privacy window and on the glass itself rested the two simple words, private investigator. Jack for a second found it funny and swore he would keel over on the spot if he saw Jessica Jones in this room. It also left him slightly confused as what they came for didn't seem like something they'd come here for, but he'd hold his reservations. They only had to wait for a moment before a speaker box above the door that Jack had completely missed crackled to life. Yeah. Richard took his hat off and had an interesting smirk on his face as he proceeded to call out to the clearly feminine occupant of the apartment, if the voice from the speaker was anything to go on. Hello Miss Coburn, I know it's been some time but I imagine you remember me. Richard called out as he looked intently into the privacy glass. Can he see in there, or what magic man, unbelievable. Jack hoped that one day real magic like he'd seen Richard do would make more sense, but he wasn't gonna hold his breathe over it. There was a string of silence, and then a loud buzz went off signaling that the door in front of them clearly had some security measures. Richard opened the door and ushered Ted and Jack in, giving Jack his first look at the person he figured a cult was bringing him to for help. Immediately Jack had to take great control of himself so as not to gape at who was in front of him. Though not Jessica Jones the person in front of him was still giving him flashbacks and at the same time caused him to have to question how the multiverse well and truly worked. The woman standing in front of him was around 59510, with dirty blonde hair, light skin, and she was dressed rather casually. Her hair was hanging loose down to her shoulders and barely hung past her eyebrows in the front. She had mild makeup on with a small amount of blush, dark eyeliner, and dark red lipstick. Her brown eyes were keenly looking at the tree of them and were only a slight shade lighter than his own eyes. The woman's outfit consisted of tight black jeans, a black undershirt, a deep red cardigan, and black combat boots on her feet. This lady was from the movie he liked watching when he was younger, The Replacement Killers. All things considered she would be considered fairly attractive if not for the scowl that was set on her face as she stared at Richard after taking in Jack and Ted. No no, whatever you want I don't care. You've got a lot of nerve coming here trench coat after that fiasco you dragged me into. People really like getting on him for that coat, don't they? Meg my dear, I don't know how many times I must apologize. I swear to you that I had no idea that the cult of Cobra was involved in that shipping yard. Had I known I would never have involved you, and I think you know that. I'm also not here on my own behalf either. My young friend here is in need of a full workup for an identity. A cult said as he raised a hand trying to placate the woman who had since crossed her arms underneath her modest bust. The woman stared at Richard for what felt like a good minute before shifting her focus to Jack himself. She then took three gliding steps forward until she was looking him right in the eye. Her right hand came up slowly as she then proceeded to grab Jack by the chin jerkily and rotate his face so she could get a better look at his features. Geez lady paws off what the heck Jack thought irritably as she let go of his chin to then turn and walk to go around her large desk, giving him a chance to look around the room they were in. The walls were a dull gray and there was very little decoration upon the walls minus a couple of hanging certificates behind the desk Meg now sat at. There were two wooden chairs sitting directly in front of the desk and a large brown leather couch against the left wall. The desk itself had a large setup of new-looking equipment ranging from a large computer tower, two monitors, a large camera facing outward, and upon the large desk itself sat a keyboard and a scattered amount of miscellaneous papers and slots for folders and such. There were a couple of filing cabinets against the walls and on the right wall there was a doorway that had beads hanging to conceal the next room. Meg glanced up with a scrutinizing gaze as she waved her right hand, bidding the three of them to sit while she reached over and picked up what looked to be a coffee cup, before she took a sip and addressed her visitors. Okay business is always good for me, but you better have the funds for it Richard you stiff me and I promise I will make a problem for you. A full identity pack takes time and I'll have to source out to some of my contacts to process it so there aren't any questions. Meg said glancing at a cult. I would never dream of stiffing you Meg," the man said with a genial smile on his face. She looked wholly convinced and then set her eyes back on Jack. All right kid I'd ask your story, but I'm gonna bet I really don't wanna know so here's how this works I'll take your picture, some fingerprints, 
and then it's gonna take about a month, two at max for me to get you your social card, birth certificate, pretty much all the basics. So please, for the love of all that is holy, do not, and I can't stress this enough, do not get into any kind of trouble that would need you to have ID. Now how old are you, where were you born, and any and all information on family if you have any will definitely be needed. She stated as she started to click on her computer, presumably to start up any programs she needed to start the whole process. The visit then took its turn, and it became all business. Jack regaled Meg with his basic information so that they could provide him with his identity papers, and then Meg spoke of the cost and Jack's eyebrows shot to his hairline. The entire venture would wind up costing $65,000 so that it could cover some bribes to get placement of certain papers and the final touches on everything else including a passport which Jack swore he would never need but was told by Ted to just sit back and let them do what they had to. Upon having to go into his family history, they hit a brief block because he had to tell Meg he had no idea who his family was, which although a lie it was necessary. He got a more than skeptical look at that, but brushed it off as soon as she glanced back at Richard again. Apparently the one instance they had mentioned had been enough to make her very suspicious about the work she would be doing for them. Though to be fair, if the one time I had met somebody and I wound up dealing with the cult of Cabra, I'd be put off too, Jack thought, as he sat trying not to fidget waiting for things to progress. Meg sat typing away, and then when she seemed done with basic setup, she instructed Jack to straighten up for a photo. She then came around with what he assumed was all the necessary tools and started taking his fingerprints. As this was going on, Jack could hear a cult and Ted talking about his training schedule, Ted talking about payment of some kind, and then finally where Jack pulled a double take his education. Oh hell no full stop. Turning in his seat drawing a light smack at the back of his dome, which he decidedly ignored from Meg, he cut the two men off. Right there is where I'm gonna interject. I cannot stress this enough, I am not going through school again hard full stop. Do not pass go. Do not collect $200. I've been through that once already and quite frankly am only concerned about two things. Getting back where I need to be, and the job that's it. Jack stated while pointing at the two men. Look kid I understand the reluctance. The point of if all being have you thought about what happens if that avenue is out the window? Have you thought about what you'll do with yourself then? Because I gotta tell ya you working at the gym for the rest of forever is fine. But I gotta say I figured you'd want more than that out of a life. Ted stated as he and a cult peered at Jack. Once again reality had seemingly slapped Jack across the face. While all this was going on the three men missed the look of intrigue pass over Meg's face but Jack wouldn't have mentioned it anyway considering what he was feeling right now. Once again Jack had to fight to not get angry, or sad for that matter recalling just what his life had now become. Awesome superpowers and nerding out over who he had met so far today aside, the question started to rattle in his head again. What if I can't go back home? The thought was annoying and unbelievably depressing. He had so much to live for in either this life or his previous one. But it's safe to say that anybody coming from Jack's situation would say they need to go back to their old life regardless if doing so lost his newfound power and broke his promise. Jack could only think of his family that been left behind, and all that that meant. He'd never see his son grow into the man he believed he could be, he wouldn't get to snuggle with a dog again, and he would never hear his wife say, I love you again. Jack had to fight hard against the tears he could already feel building as he took a low shuddering breathe. He could see the looks the two men were giving him, and the frustration he took from that alone was enough to keep him from getting overly emotional. I'm not gonna let this break me. There has to be a way back, and I'll be damned if I don't find it. Jack thought as he tightened his hands into fists and put what he felt was his bravest and most resolute face on. It's a big world. I'll find what I need somehow, and I've got Richard in my corner, so that's one avenue I'm not worried about looking down. While that's going on I'm gonna do what I know I can in the meantime. If I need to worry about school at some point I'll get my Jed, but right now the thing I'm worried about most is my new addition. Everything else I'll take as it comes. Jack said as he gave Ted a pointed look while Meg was walking around back to sit in her desk chair. The woman took a brief look at them clearly confused by the pattern of speech but then quickly moved along. Okay well this has all been very riveting. And while I appreciate the payday, this brings I've got other things to handle. 
Come back in a month, I should have everything ready. And until then don't worry about payment just in case I can't get the hospital or birth records set. If that happens it'll take longer, but we'll make it happen." Meg said as she gesticulated towards the door obviously dismissing the group from her office. With a brief set of thanks given the three left and made the trek back to Ted's gym to sort out the rest of the day. After getting back to the gym Richard politely said short goodbyes to Ted and Jack, promising that he wouldn't be gone for more than a week at the most. I'm going to put things into motion to get the equipment that we talked about. Meanwhile you should stay focused on your side of these preparations. Remember to stay vigilant, don't push yourself too hard, and above all know that Ted and I are here for you my young friend," a cult said as he shook Jack's hand and turned to leave the gym. After saying goodbye to Richard Jack and Ted went upstairs so that Ted could show Jack where he would be staying for the foreseeable future. It's not much but it's home. I lean more towards the practical for my lifestyle, and I better not hear any complaints all right," Ted said as he and Jack entered the apartment. Jack looked around to see the brick walls, the slightly polished wooden floor, and same space as the gym below. The major difference being that this was obviously a place of living, though there was still some equipment scattered about even here, most obviously for personal use. The floor has a kitchenette with a granite-looking floor the living room taking up about half of the 200 by 300 foot setting of the open floor of the apartment. Jack could see four separate doors, two on the left side of the room across from the back of a black leather couch and love seat combo the other two on right. The coffee table in front of the couches was in the set of a yin yang, and in front of that was what looked to be a 52 inch flat screen TV on a black stand. On the far right wall was a desk with what looked to be a decent computer setup. The outer half of the room away from the comfy area had a heavy bag, a treadmill, gymnastic rings, a speed bag, and a rack with free weights going all the way up to 90 walked Jack over to the far left side and opened the door revealing a room with a brown dresser with full vanity mirror, a full-sized bed with a black headboard, a medium-sized brown desk with drawers with its own black swivel chair, and a small nightstand with a single bulb lamp on it. This'll be your room. I'll take you shopping tomorrow for anything you think you need for supplies. Richard gave me a bankroll for ya, and then after that I'll be paying ya for working in the gym so everything should kind of even out. For now I've got a stash of merch clothing from the gym you can use to knock around in inside the drawers in your room, plus obviously what little you have. Those two doors are the laundry room and the bathroom which has all the basics you'll need," Ted said to the Jack's surprise and consternation. Jack immediately went to say that neither of the men had needed to do that, but then cut himself off. You know I should probably just shut my mouth and accept that they are helping me like this because if they didn't I'd be Saul. Jack looked back up quickly from that thought and heard the rest of what Ted was saying. While we're up here let's establish the ground rules okay. I know you're an adult in a kid's body, but since I'm looking after ya I expect you in here by no later than 11 p.m. unless you let me know something's going on. And that really doesn't even start until you're doing patrols, so let's say till then try to be in by 10 at the latest when I'm cool with you going out. I know it should go without saying, but you are to absolutely bring no girls up here. That's not gonna be a thing. The twitching eyebrow he saw on Ted's face was enough to tell him how he felt about being interrupted. Just shut up and listen Junior look I get it, you just lost everything, and you wanna go home I get that. But if and that's a big if we find out you can't go back I don't want you thinking that you can just free for all it here, that's not to say that I don't want you to try and move on if that's what happens. I know it's probably the farthest thing from your mind, but it had to be said. Obviously I live here, but you're gonna help me keep an eye on what we have since we're now both eating here. So if you think we need something let me know. Your training should be the highest priority. That being said, are you sure you won't go to school? Everything that Ted brought up was valid, and Jack had no problem doing everything to help make Ted's life easier chores, whatever, so long as he could get stronger. Even if it meant feeling like an idiot for now being at the bottom of the totem pole again. After digesting and easily accepting those rules, he quickly remembered the first and last thing the man had said. I'm not worried. Getting my jet is fine I have to get in fighting shape and figure out what my limits are and then go beyond them. I've gotta be honest I'd rather not even think about home or anything like it, except how to get back. I'm not gonna say I'd never move on, but I'd rather not talk about that right now so let's just move on. 
The conversation so far had been all right, but Jack had to say that the last bit was leaving him again decidedly depressed. I gotta keep it together here, or I'm not gonna be able to do any of this, Jack thought as he waited for Ted to continue. Jack's feelings must have been apparent because another look of pity passed over Ted's face before he started again. All right, all right. I'm gonna be candid with you here, Jack. I really don't know how to do this. I've never been in charge of anybody but myself outside of training someone so that makes this a new experience for me. But I'll be damned if I mess it up so I really need you to follow my instructions. I know I'm not your dad or anything like that, but this is an important responsibility and I take that responsibility very seriously. Ted said as the two walked over to the living area to sit on the couches facing each other. Gotham is a shithole of a city, plain and simple. There's no ifs, ends, or buts about it. This place almost has a life of its own, and it will put you in the ground if you let it. It might be home, but the fact is I know what this place is like, and it's a hard place and makes an even harder people. For the next two months, I don't want you leaving the gym without me, I want to make sure I can help you get a basic layout of this part of the city and we're gonna make an exercise out of it. Ted then went ahead and started to explain to Jack his plan for helping Jack adjust to city life here in Gotham and to test Jack's situational awareness skills. Ted made it very clear that he was concerned that Jack would be taken by someone or mugged considering the city, especially on this side of it, was full of degenerates and criminals. Ted made it abundantly clear that just because he had metapowers did not mean that he could just go toe-to-toe -to -toe with some of the nut jobs that ran around the city, or even just the ones with guns. Jack knew better than to judge a book by its cover, and had no delusions that this place or any other for that matter was as safe as it seemed, especially Gotham. So Jack did the only sensible thing and probed carefully with his questions about who Wildcat knew of that operated on the wrong side of the law here in Gotham without giving away that he knew many of the names already. And if Jack was being honest it was just as bad as he figured it'd be. Batman had apparently been active since 2000 and in that time since his debut and subsequent beginning of his war on crime, the Joker, Mr. Freeze, Poison Ivy. The Scarecrow, Penguin, Bane, and many others had already become headlines across the Gotham Times as threats to the city. Knowing that on top of them that Gotham's infrastructure was probably already teeming with corrupt cops and politicians, it seemed like the Dark Knight could use all the help he could get. Though Jack knew for a fact that his first run-in with Batman would probably be very unpleasant at best and bad at its worst. Batman in the comics had a clear-cut line for how things operated in his city, and it was simple. No other heroes were actually welcome. Sure there had been plenty of times that Batman had teamed up with others to deal with a crisis albeit begrudgingly, but the Dark Knight had made it quite clear across many forms of media that Jack enjoyed. That much like the criminals he dealt with on a daily basis other heroes in his city were also considered persona non grata in Gotham. This thought alone left Jack really hoping to avoid what he knew was going to be the eventual run-in with Gotham's current protector. The other thought currently dominating his mind was the front headline on the newspaper sitting on Ted's coffee table. Salvatter, Sal Veilstra acquitted of all charges in triple homicide. Great, on top of all the supervillains there are also the normal scumbuckets to deal with wonderful. Jack thought as he glanced at the paper, though he didn't feel like picking it up. The thought that people like Sal Veilstra, Rupert Thorne, and of course Roman Sianus were in the case of Sal and could be in case of the other possibilities left Jack thoroughly annoyed. All those people whether they existed or not right now was inconsequential, all of them being big-time underworld criminals and holding a ridiculous amount of influence due to racketeering, extortion, and all the other kinds of crime that made scum like them powerful. If any of these guys set even a toe out of line, the first thing I'm gonna do when I'm ready is take them down, rip them out root and stem like the weeds they are. Jack thought as he idly listened to Ted talking about what he knew of the criminal underworld. Did that sound just a bit overconfident and like quite a bit more than Jack should try maybe? But Jack was resolved to make a difference, and he could be stubborn so sue him. Surprisingly for a man that claimed to be so far removed from the hero game, Ted actually knew quite a bit, as far as Jack was concerned. One piece of information that Ted gave Jack as he got up and went to the kitchen to rummage through what was there to put together a dinner for them, was that District Attorney Harvey Dent was attempting to get a leg up on the organized crime of Gotham City right now. 
Hopefully he can hold out long enough to not have acid dumped on his face and then I can try to make myself available to keep that from happening at all. One less villain the city will have to deal with that way. Not to mention the guy deserves a normal life, Jack thought as Ted started to make them a spaghetti dinner. The rest of the afternoon into the evening was spent between the two men getting to know each other over basics, with Jack sharing a good majority of his previous life with Ted. When asked what prompted him to give so much information Jack gave Ted a very simple reply. It's like you said you are technically responsible for me now. Please don't think I'm not grateful for that because I am immensely so. I don't know if I'll ever be able to repay you but I'm damn sure gonna try. Jack said as he and Ted sat down to eat their dinner later that night. Wildcat had waved Jack off telling him that as much as he wanted to deny it, he felt it was his personal responsibility to help anybody jumping into the life, as he called it. He went on to tell Jack that couldn't have sent him off anywhere else with a clean conscience, as he said he knew for a fact that Richard was always too busy and quite frankly mixed up in stuff that was way too weird for any hero let alone a newbie. Jack had wanted to feel indignant about that statement, but simply kept his mouth shut. He figured it would be better off not to get arrogant, and once again found himself needing to take a breath and remind himself that he was better than that, and to not let his emotions get away with him. Man hormones are so annoying, how did I go through this the first time again? Jack thought to himself as he helped Ted clean up the dishes from their dinner, lamenting over the fact that he was now a teenager once again. He offered to split the cooking with Ted if he would like considering that was what he had done for a good majority of his adulthood for his job with the guard, to which his mentor readily agreed saying he hated how tedious it was. After the cleanup Ted told him he was gonna go down and check on things with the gym and get ready for close-up. He let Jack know that tomorrow wouldn't be a super early day and that Jack could take it kind of easy in the morning if he wanted. He figured he would need the rest from how jarring things had been. It was already about 8.30 at night so Jack bid Ted a good one and went to what would now be his room. Jack grabbed a pair of the light workout gear that was in the drawer in the room for him, and then went to the bathroom to find an extra toothbrush in a box and towels already in there. He cleaned himself up and then headed back to his room and shut the door and turned down the bed and climbed in to go to sleep. Jack had a rough time falling asleep at first, only being able to dwell on thoughts of his family and how much he missed them. He kept circling back to the thought that he wouldn't be able to get home but would then quickly push down the sadness that would bring, though he'd be lying if he said that he didn't have tears well in his eyes. He couldn't say how long it took but eventually he slipped into unconsciousness, thinking of how much he loved his family and just trying to hold on to the memory of their voices as they said how much they loved him. Waking up again had him quickly having to re-evaluate all that had happened, but it didn't take long. So after getting out of bed he went and took a shower to fully wake, and then found himself in the kitchen setting up the coffee maker seeing that the digital clock said it was 0630 after he had finished his morning routine. Needing a distraction, and now fully awake after smelling the brewing coffee Jack did the best to what he hoped would become his familiar schedule and walked over to the workout area and started out on the treadmill. Jack did sprint intervals for about 26 minutes from 2.5 miles an hour for a minute and then taking it up to 7.8 miles an hour for a minute. He hadn't even broken a sweat and was actually quite proud of the fact. So he then disengaged from the treadmill telling himself that he would do a second set while using one for all to get a base on what he figured he could run when pushing it. Jack then started in on his typical body weight routine and was about a quarter of the way through his third set of his sets when Ted emerged from his room dressed in a white wife beater, black sweatpants, and black trainers. Jack gave Ted a mild wave and received a nod in return as his mentor went to pour himself a cup of coffee and apparently figured Jack would want one because he poured two cups and then brought a tray over to the coffee table and gestured for Jack to join him. Jack had been in the middle of his squats but stopped and made his way over and sat down after an awkward moment before Ted had gestured to the couch so Jack could flop down. Don't worry about being sweaty and sitting down. Just make sure you wipe it down with a sanitary wipe before we leave okay?" Ted said as they both made their cups the way they liked them and then proceeded to plot out the rest of their day. Ted went on to talk about going further into the city to let Jack shop and he was only half interested because he found he'd rather just stay here today and work out. 
when he expressed that Ted made it clear that he wanted to pick up some things too, and therefore they'd be killing two birds with one stone. Jack got cleaned up again after they finished their coffee and then the two proceeded to head downstairs and get ready to head out to the store. As they were leaving and Ted was briefing one of his employees, though is when Jack came to the realization that this was going to be an interesting day. Jack and Ted were immediately greeted by Helena outside the front desk who was wearing a small black leather jacket, what looked to be a dark purple shirt of some kind underneath, black jeans and jet black top high top sneakers. You ready to go old timer I got some stuff I needed to do, I want to move this along. Came her way of greeting as she gave Jack a brief wave, but then started at Ted with her hands on her hips. Just waitin' on my plus one kid don't get your panties in a wad. Ted said to what appeared Helena's consternation at being made to wait and Jack's confusion. Plus one, Jack thought, before he saw the double doors open. Teddy bear it's been a while. Jack saw her and he knew who she was even off a first glance. He had just been really hoping that he wasn't going to meet anybody else that he knew of for a while. Selena Kyle, there's no frickin' way. Jack had seen many women in his time. He had seen beautiful women up close and personal, and obviously as a hot-blooded male, he'd seen many through a computer screen as most young boys tend to at one point or another. Having the opportunity to see this particular woman as close as he was now though left him awestruck. Helena had a certain beauty to her. Jack wasn't blind. Jack could also clearly remember in his mind's eye what she looked like in the JLU show. And if this Helena was going to be anywhere close to that, which in a way she was already pretty damn close, she would be an absolute heartbreaker. Having any possible thoughts about her would be absolutely natural thing if not for the obvious de-aging and recent separation from his family that he had gone through. How did Cap not get creeped out in the McHugh when he thought to go for Sharon? Jack thought once that particular line went through his brain, even though he knew for a fact that the two situations were completely different. Again, though after shaking a little to rid himself of those awkward feelings, that brought back the thought of who had just walked through the double doors of Ted's gym. Even in his previous life Jack knew only a few women who looked even close to like who he knew this woman was. She was slightly tall, and if Jack had to take a guess he would be exactly eye level with her making her at the very least 5'6 to 5'7 without the shoes she was wearing. He knew from only the three feet or so that now separated them that Selena Kyle had very striking green eyes, almost like emeralds in the way they sparkled. Selena's hair was done up into a symmetrical pixie cut, her black locks short but most definitely lustrous if the light catching them was anything to go by. Voluptuous didn't even cover the way this woman looked, and he didn't need the slight elbow that Helena had given him after aligning with his right side to know that he was staring. Though to be fair Jack's mouth had only hung open for a moment. So sue him, he is a guy, and most of the time guys do like to observe a beautiful woman. Now however though he knew he was staring, and if anyone was able to actually see his thoughts, they would think him a creep for a completely different reason. He had already begun to size her up. The fact stood this woman was and could still be a threat. She had fought Batman before numerous times and even got the better of him through guile and misdirection. Great, thinking like the bat now. Gonna have to curb that a smidge so I don't become an absolute jerk, Jack thought as he continued to observe Selina talking to Ted. There was no doubt in Jack's mind that Selina could vie for the most beautiful women in the world title but he was looking at her in a much more calculating way, even knowing what he knew and how he felt about the way Batman's paranoia came into play. He figured he could at least copy it a little when it came to people like Catwoman. The woman was much like the Bat himself that way, everything about her could be considered a weapon. Though voluptuous, if there was any fat on Selina at all it was in the more sensual parts of her body. Though Jack was convinced that she didn't actually have any real fat on her, that she just had the genetics along with having put in considerable work to look as good as she did. Her curves were in all the right places, but it was the definition in her forearms and her slightly exposed calves that painted the picture of her athleticism, and that was what left Jack in a bit of awe. Even through her outfit Jack swore he could see her core contract and that he could make out the slight lines of her toned stomach. Her bust was more than generous looking though he knew that at the moment it was being pushed up by the top she was wearing. Her hips were slightly wide, 
and if Jack got a good side profile of her in workout gear, he'd say she was definitely any and every Instagram model's inspiration back home. Everything about her screamed danger from her aura of confidence, to her looks, even to her outfit, and the way it was meant to draw you in. Everything about her could and would be used as a distraction or in a lethal way, and that was what made her so dangerous in Jack's opinion. Her outfit consisting of a very expensive-looking gold chain necklace that hung down to her slightly exposed cleavage was one of the tells which at the bottom had a tear-shaped crystal wrapped in a gold blockade that was reminiscent of a shaved peel that corkscrewed around the two-inch-long-looking crystal. She had a dark green slim-fit leather jacket over what was obviously a black strapless crop top, black leather pleather pants, and some very stylish thick two-inch black heels completing the ensemble. On both of Selena's wrists, she had bright gold bangles that both had gleaming crystals about the size of basic marbles, the same color as the one in her necklace, and she had a plain unadorned rose gold band on her right ring finger. Her posture was absolutely flawless, and the most frustrating thing was Jack never understood how some women could be so comfortable in heels of all things, even if they were flat ones like Selena's. Jack and Helena both proceeded to clear the space between themselves and the adults and further Jack was watching Selena intently. She had her right hand out on Ted's left arm and was sporting what seemed to be a genuine smile, though again the nasty voice at the back of Jack's head was saying it could all be a game which left Jack coaching himself in his own mind again. Need to try and remain calm, impassive. In the comics Ted first and foremost took Selena in and protected her taught her to defend herself. Life kicked her in the teeth when she was down, and she didn't have it anywhere near easy. But then again, whoever really does. I also need to remember that Catwoman at times has been a certified hero. I mean hell, she married Bruce in the one timeline, though I'm going to doubt that's happened here yet, if it's going to happen at all. No matter, the main thing is to not come off confrontational. Of all the things I would need it would most certainly not be having Catwoman of all people as a pain in my side at any point. Not to mention I don't need any wedges between me and Ted for me being a paranoid ass Jack thought as they stood waiting for Ted and Selena to finish with their hellos and apparent catch-up. At that thought Selena herself had turned and started to look at both Jack and Helena. Her smirk was ever-present, and with her right hip slightly cocked out while looking at them the silence then started to set in. The bustle of the gym was evident. Machines, weights being set up and down, music in the background, idle chatter, even one of the only two TVS that was down in the gym was on and apparently playing the news. But the silence between the four that were supposed to be going shopping was evident if you were paying attention. Ted had his arms crossed with a slight smile on his face while he patiently observed what was turning into what could be considered a good old-fashioned Mexican standoff. If this had been a movie that is between his three students' companions, Selena as always was poised and calm. But Jack could tell she was doing something all thieves and fighters learned how to do. She was sizing the both of them up. The look was calculating, and if Jack was picking her vibe up right, just a tad bit condescending. All in all exactly what he'd expected when he ran into Catwoman. So kiddies, Ted tells me you too need a woman's opinion to get you outfitted with some half-decent clothes. Selena said as she broke the silence. The tone and inflection was playful with just an underscore of teasing which did exactly as Jack knew it would in Helena's case as she immediately took offense and went straight on the counteroffensive. Well tried anyway. Listen here you hussy I don't need. Helena's right hand was pointing directly at Selena, her fiery temper immediately on display as she launched into her tirade. And it would have been a thing to behold but Jack had little time for it. And more importantly wanted to establish a certain footing with everyone present. Stepping into the line of fire might not have been the best idea but Jack was not one for wasting time. As interesting as it would be to see you have a go at her Helena, the lady was joking if you couldn't tell by her tone, and you having that reaction was exactly what she wanted. You need to relax some. We're going out to shop and that's not a big thing, so don't get your panties twisted up okay? Jack said as he immediately interjected himself sideways between the two women he knew of placing one hand on Helena's arm in an attempt to lower it. Having both women in his line of sight was to his benefit, as he was able to see while also hearing Selena's slight chuckling, and Helena's immediate flushing of anger which let him quickly quicker than he should have if he was being honest dodge what would have been a quick left jab to the face as he stepped back fluidly. 
Had Jack seen Ted or Selina at that moment, he would have seen both looking impressed and curious as Helena was no slouch in the speed department. The look of brief shock on Helena however faded quickly into fury again as she took a slight step into Jack's personal space and poked him in the chest with her right pointer finger. First off let's make this very clear right now got it. My panties are none of your business and second. If you ever try and touch me again it'll break the hand. Helena said as she added slight pressure to the firm poke she was leveling at Jack's right pectoral. The situation would have honestly been funny any other time to Jack. But he definitely didn't like being threatened or touched the way that Helena was at the moment, but did his best to play it cool and simply raised his right eyebrow now mostly facing her. Quickly seeing that the situation was heading south Ted took over before it could escalate to anything further than it had already. Helena, that's enough Jack is right. Selena was trying to get a rise out of you and you gave her exactly what she wanted. Damn it girl I keep telling you. You can't get sore every time somebody says something you think is out of line. And going for a swing on somebody you know nothing about is just as bad as you overreacting to the words. You don't seem to be paying very good attention. That or your ego needs another check because Jack could have taken you apart after that swing and here you are antagonizing him some more. Ted said as he was now barely a foot from both teens. Helena immediately colored again from what Jack assumed was either embarrassment because of the crack about her ego needing a check and the thought of how that was done, anger, or maybe both. But to be fair Ted wasn't wrong. One for all and all of Jack's previous experience had been put to the test just then, and already the combo was proving great and Jack had only been channeling 2%. Jack from the moment he had woken up had decided that he needed to have one for all flowing through himself as often as possible to acclimate to having it going. And so was resolved to have it going at a low enough output to not be overtly noticed by others or to cause himself any pain but still make a difference to his movement. There had been massive debate between fans back home whether or not people saw the green sparks that one for all produced around Deku, or now in this case Jack himself. As far as he could tell they weren't on display yet because no one was staring at him weird. Jack knew for a fact that he had shown Richard the sparks by concentrating on just his hand and made them more prevalent. And that was when he was using 5% but in the show you could see mild sparks all around Deku when he focused it around his body. But again Jack was only using 2% and as far as he could tell after the first few moments of channeling it. The spark seemed to fade into nothingness, though Jack could still feel the power flowing through and around himself. On top of the fact that his quirk was now going through his system Jack also not only had a slight understanding of Helena's background and possible attitude, but he also had the experience of having been through enough training, and having been in enough scraps to see her telegraph the movement through the drawback of her shoulder for the thrust of the strike she threw. No mistake about it Helena was top-notch in her speed. But if you see a strike coming a mile off and let it hit you that's on you, and there was absolutely no way Jack was going to let that happen. Jack didn't like getting punched in the face as a general rule of life. This girl is gonna be a handful and a half. Any attempt at making friends with her is gonna be just a joy Jack thought as he was still looking dead into Helena's eyes. The tenseness died down slightly when Selena's chuckles became more vocal as she watched the two teens' interaction. Teddy bear's not wrong you know girly. The kid doesn't look like much at first but I can tell he's fought before now that I'm paying attention. And the second your shock set in there was probably about three different things the kid could have done to make you pay for that slip. The fact that he didn't shows he's either chivalrous, generous, or very kind, all three of those things being very low held in my personal regard. I would have dropped you like a bad habit for such a blatant strike. Selena said as she crossed her arms under her bust while speaking in what was now obvious condescension to Helena. The sneer that broke out on Helena's face was something to behold as she turned her vision back to Selena and if Jack was being honest, it was ever so slightly intimidating. Let it not be said that Jack didn't have a fully developed sense of self-preservation. Jesus, this is gonna be a long day if this is the road we're gonna go down. Normal women can be scary when they wanna be. Ones that are close to Olympic level fitness and know how to fight are worse, Jack thought as he again turned slightly so he was now able to look at both of the women at the same time. Luckily any chance at a fight breaking out was quickly shot down by Ted's intervention. Apparently he too had just about enough of the way things had been going. Helena enough, 
Selena would you quit trying to antagonize the girl, she's a hot head, and as much fun as it usually is to watch you wind somebody up we need to get moving. Ted stated as he looked between the two women after having pinched the bridge of his nose most probably in an attempt to stave off a headache. From that point things went relatively smooth in Jack's opinion, with the two women acquiescing to Ted's request. Even though it was more like a demand, and the fact that it was done begrudgingly on Helena's part. Jack knew for a fact that if those two ever met suited up, it was going to be a serious problem. The four quickly left the gym and hoped on a bus down the right of the block from the gym and took it to Gotham City Central Mall. The trip had been short and wound up only taking them about 15 minutes via the bus ride to get there and begin the expedition for the day. The group had made mild small talk, though it remained stunted due to the interaction from earlier that morning. Jack mostly decided to talk to Ted directly while Selena herself seemed content to just enjoy quiet as they traveled to the mall, while Helena had plugged herself into her phone to listen to some music or watch a video. Ted and Jack again went over a small list of things Jack would need to get while they were at the mall. Richard had conjured a pair of black trainers with socks for Jack to wear when they had initially made the move to meet Ted. Though he had immediately advised Jack to buy a pair this way, he wouldn't have the unfortunate experience of them just disappearing off him. Conjured items would only last so long outside of the caster's active magic after all. Jack's list for shopping was very basic ranging from all the different clothes he would need as well as to supplement through the winter since they were already in September and sure enough the weather would quickly turn. He would also need a phone which Ted had said he himself would pay for so he could have Jack on his plan, making it easier for them to stay in touch. Ted had also pushed him to get some things for entertainment if he had wanted, citing that Jack was in fact a kid. Though if he was being honest with himself he wasn't planning on being frivolous with his spending or on going much of anywhere until his training was up. Jack knew he would have to do the recon training that Wildcat planned to put him through. But other than that Jack wasn't interested in getting out much or having many distractions. My main focus is getting strong, strong enough that I'll hopefully be able to avoid the issues Izuku dealt with when it came to using one for all. That, and then figuring out what a patrol route would look like for myself. I need to make sure I don't bog myself down with too many overt distractions, Jack thought as they disembarked the bus and arrived at the mall. While walking into the rather large mall that rather reminded Jack of the one mall he had visited back home in New York City, he observed his fellow traveling companions again. Helena had remained plugged in but was seemingly very aware of her surroundings as they made their way into the crowed three-story building. Ted and Selena seemed to be reminiscing about something again, and Jack did his best not to eavesdrop. They first made their way to Old Navy at Jack's request which Ted attempted to warn Jack off of saying that Richard had left him a decent bankroll of $3,500 cash to work with, stating that he could get some really nice clothes if he wanted. After mentally balking at the amount Richard had left him he shook his head and affirmed to Ted that he didn't particularly care about having vintage or expensive type clothing and that he just wanted stuff that would fit and be comfortable noticing that he got sidelong glances from both of the women with them. Selena herself seemed to be tutting under her breathe at Jack, though he wasn't overly concerned about it. He wasn't here to impress anybody with his looks, and had never really thought much of himself any two ways about it when it came to that anyway. The excursion into Old Navy had taken about two and a half hours, and had Jack leaving carrying four bags while Ted carried two for him with a decent-sized box under his left arm. At some point Ted had excused himself from Old Navy and left Jack at the tender mercies of Selena and for even a moment Helena, as they both offered up opinions about choices of color and style for his dressing needs. Jack now had a pair of real black cross trainers, a simple pair of black boots, four pairs of black cargo pants, three pairs of blue jeans, twelve different t-shirts of varying dark colors, assorted underwear and socks, a light dark gray windbreaker jacket, thermals for when it got cold, and all the other assorted essentials for the weather shift to winter. Overall, while slightly perturbed that he wound up having to deal with putting on an impromptu fashion show for Catwoman of all people. The woman was doing everything she could to make him blush and unfortunately, even had he still been an adult, he was bound to do so due to her remarks and invading his personal space. He found that the trip had been worthwhile, 
and the clerk had been nice and given him 30% off of everything he bought making it, so he wound up only spending $480, leaving him with quite a bit of the bankroll thank Richard left over. Ted had returned as they were checking out, and had shown that he had gone and gotten Jack a birthday present, which he immediately tried to tell him to take back, but Ted would have none of it. Ted had gone up to the third floor to a vintage leather store and bought Jack a midnight black leather jacket that reminded Jack of Dean Winchester's leather jacket from the first couple of seasons of Supernatural, and it came with a sturdy black leather wallet attached to a relatively sturdy-looking chain as well. Jack was already dressed in one of the pairs of the cargo pants, along with a dark green V-neck cut t-shirt and the black boots and quickly donned the jacket as well, while tucking the wallet into his inner right breast pocket. Immediately he got a thumbs up of approval from Helena, though Jack wasn't surprised considering what she was wearing and again as he had gotten a few times already Selena gave a sly wink and made a comment about him now looking rugged and handsome, which of course had her chuckling shortly after as Jack again turned red from the attention. This is ridiculous, it is so much worse that I'm a teen again, and she knows that her looks would knock even a grown man out of his socks, Jack thought as they continued the trek through the mall. Jack was only able to thank his lucky stars that Helena for all intents and purposes seemed to not really care about him one way or the other, even though they had gotten off to a rocky start earlier that day. When she had offered her opinions she seemed very detached and had barely passed him a second glance, which Jack was actually quite thankful for. Jack did not do well under scrutiny even at the best of times and had resolved to fix that issue with Ted's help later on. The group next visited the Verizon store and got Jack a smartphone that Ted was happy to put on his data plan, citing that he would need it to stay in touch with Jack when he was ready to venture out into the wide world. Though if Jack was being honest with himself, he had the sneaking suspicion that Ted would use it to keep an eye on him through GPS. After that the group browsed for a while stopping at a coupe different stores for Helena and Selena as they both cited that they wanted to go for their own choices for clothes shopping and even though she had seemed against it earlier Helena seemed to be deferring to Selena in the fashion department asking questions and even receiving her suggestions with little complaint, a massive change from earlier in the day. They had wound up going to three different stores and each one left Jack feeling conflicted and mortified at the same time. I can't take this, the teasing is one thing, but they are taking forever too on top of it, Jack thought as he suffered through the shopping experience. He had done it many times before, but still didn't have to like it. All in all the trip to the mall wrapped up a little after 13.30, with the group having gotten lunch at the food court of the mall at Esparo, again leaving Jack in slight awe that some things seemed to carry over. Verizon and Old Navy were one thing, though they seemed like smaller stores now. Oh well, at least they have some good food around, Jack thought as they left reflecting over the deluxe-sized slice of plain Sicilian pizza he had. After the group took the ride back to the corner from the gym itself and then made it to the front of the gym, Selena excused herself saying she would go home and drop off her new purchases Helena following suit and saying the same thing as she headed left to head back to the group home. For a moment Jack wanted to question Ted why he had never offered to take Helena in, but the thought better of it and decided to wait a bit before prying either of them with that line of questioning. Jack and Ted then made their way inside and Jack proceeded to split from Ted heading upstairs so that he could wash most of his new clothes. The time started to fly by in the apartment for Jack and slowly, but surely he had finished all his laundry and packed all his clothes away in his new room. He then started to commence with another set of workouts for the day. After about two hours or so Jack was actually summoned by Ted, so he gathered his wits and walked down into the gym proper noticing that it was relatively empty again even though it was close to four in the afternoon. Seeing Ted walk out of his office now dressed in a black wife beater and black workout pants with two sets of gloves in his arms Jack knew that things were about to pick up. Tossing one of the sets of gloves to Jack, Ted started walking towards the boxing ring and gestured for Jack to follow without saying a word. Okay, so we're doing this now, great Jack thought as he fastened the first glove on his left hand while he proceeded to get into the ring. All right, kiddo, it's time to see where you're at. Now I'm not gonna lie to ya, I'm not that great at holding back when it comes to this kind of thing so I expect you to give me all you got ya here. I'm not gonna have you half-assing me in this ring ever. 
And for reference, if you think I'm gonna go easy because you're technically a newbie, you got another thing coming. Ted said as he started to bounce on the balls of his feet, both gloves now on while he basically glided from side to side in front of Jack in the ring. Jack now had both gloves on and started to mildly stretch while keeping his eyes zeroed on Ted, knowing that if he dropped his guard this would be over rather quickly. Let's be clear on this one. Right now is without your gift all right, I want to see where you're at on your own so we can build you base. God forbid you're ever in a situation where you can't use it, I don't want you dependent. Ted said lowly enough for only Jack to hear as he squared up his guard and started to advance on Jack's position. The movement quickly however snapped Jack back to reality and out of possible thoughts on what could impede him from using one for all. Nobody that size should be able to move that quickly or quietly. Jack thought with trepidation as he quickly took his basic stance, his hands upheld and firm, but loose fists his arms vertically covering his front allowing him to guard his front, face, and sides if need be, while imitating Ted and having started to bounce on the balls of his feet. The slight smile that Ted gave was the only quick indication that Jack knew what he was doing was good before it began. And oh boy did it start. Jack's prior experience was all that kept him from getting his block knocked off right then as Ted moved in with a quick two-jab combo that followed with a right hook that would have put Jack's lights out. Jack had barely seen it coming but tightened his guard and lowered himself ever so slightly, and then started to bob and weave trying to flow into a quick Dempsey roll. Ted obviously saw it and the smirk on his face and light in his eyes showed what Jack took as approval, though he wasn't even close to done with the assault. Ted pulled back barely half a step and then quickly lunged forward into what would have been a gazelle punch. But he used it as a push that nearly took Jack off his feet and forced him into the back right corner next to where he had entered the ring. That alone, though not having done any real damage at the time was a problem for Jack in its own way, as his head had snapped back a bit on impact with the corner padding. Jesus, he's not playing. Jack thought as he had to quickly shake his head from the slight disorientation only to have to tighten his guard as his eyes widened like dinner plates realizing that Ted was already on him again and that the disorientation was far from done. The following onslaught was rough and Jack could already tell that his arms were going to be badly bruised. Jabs and crosses rained down on his guard and were rattling him to his core as they came with barely seconds between each new blow that was all but whittling him down. What's a matter kid you having a rough time? Ted asked with a smile in his voice as he continued to batter Jack's guard. Gonna have to take a shot or I'm done here Jack thought as he continued to wait watching Ted as best he could from behind his guard, hoping to find a chance to at least attempt a counter. Ted was relentless and it seemed like he wouldn't back off anytime soon, but then out of nowhere he slowed down a fraction and had seemed to drop his left shoulder a bit. Taking that as an invitation Jack made a move, though he figured it would throw Ted off balance because Jack wasn't a sap and had no plans to just blindly swing. Sure enough Jack saw Ted's eyes widen as Jack quickly fainted as if to take a swing knowing that's what Ted was expecting him to do. But he then squatted down and then quickly sprung forward in a vault under Ted's right side and then kipped up to his feet and turned to face Ted. Knowing that he would just get more of the same as before Jack quickly two-stepped and put himself into striking distance of Ted. A rabbit punch, followed by a one-two combo starting with a left jab led into an attempt at a back elbow on Ted's chin. Jack knew for a fact that he was at way too many disadvantages even if this was just a spar, but he would be damned if he wasn't gonna give it everything. Ted had blocked or ducked everything that Jack had thrown but Jack was determined and he continued to relentlessly push forward even knowing that he might not have success at all in the venture of trying to land a blow on Ted. The one-two combos transferred into double jabs followed by right hooks and alternating straights, and after Jack would either attempt another back elbow from alternating sides and had even slipped in a back fist from his left which came perilously close to clipping across Ted's jaw actually making the old boxer's eyebrows raise. Just a little more gotta keep pushing. Jack thought as he continued to advance on his trainer, knowing that it was all relatively in vain, and yet Jack couldn't help but be excited in the moment. The adrenaline was pumping, and he could feel his pulse beating through his ears as he threw blow after blow. Ted had begun to push back every once in a while, not willing to fully give Jack control of their exchange, though that was when Jack decided to take a major risk. 
Well, this ain't gonna tickle, that's for sure, Jack thought as he waited for Ted's next retaliatory swing, which actually wound up being an uppercut to the body. Ted had cleared the foot and a half of space between them and had swung, and Jack took full advantage of the hit as it came. Jack had dug his feet into the canvas leaning on the balls of his feet and allowed the hit to connect and at the point of contact had expelled his breathe trying to roll with a hit. Jack had been hit before by plenty of people and Jack knew for a fact that the hit hadn't been full power, but even still it had almost made him double over, Ted's form being perfect allowing him to drive all the force of the blow into him. But even so Jack had just enough presence of mind to go for his desperate retaliation strike, and believe it or not it had actually paid off if only for a moment. Jack had used Ted's surprise about him taking the hit to quickly latch onto the back of Ted's neck with both hands in what would have been considered a loose attempt at the tie clinch, but knowing that Ted would be able to counter Jack waited for that attempt. The second that had passed ended like lightning with Ted attempting to bring both of his meaty arms up and knock Jack's obviously smaller ones away, and that's when Jack actually surprised Ted. Jack quickly was able to break off the hold and jump back half a step landing on his left and had coiled his right leg and lashed out with a textbook sidekick which connected with Ted's jaw actually snapping the older fighter's head to the side and making him stumble back about two steps. Jack didn't attempt to revel in the victory and quickly bounced into Ted's space to attempt another barrage, but was quickly cut off when his left straight was caught in Ted's right, and he was dragged bodily into an elbow that rattled his ribcage and insides. The follow-up straight right sent Jack right to the land of unconsciousness. About 20 minutes later Jack found himself waking up on Ted's couch in his office with a pillow under his head and an ice pack on his face which Jack found himself wholly grateful for because he had a splitting headache and was sure that his face was either already swelled or would have if not for the pack. Jesus Christ the man hits like a sledgehammer. But I guess that's what makes you a five-time world heavyweight champion and the basically normal guy that could smack down supervillains, Jack thought as he slowly started to sit up on the couch while he clutched the pack to his face and his vision started to clear up. As he looked up he could see Ted sitting behind his desk with both hands interlocked under his chin while he glanced at Jack with what Jack assumed was a pensive expression. Well kid I'll give you this much you landed a solid hit on me, and it sure as hell didn't tickle. Sorry about that right that put you out. If I'm being honest I didn't think you'd actually land anything solid on me, so I may have put a little oomph in the strike. Ted said as he unfolded his hands and stood up and grabbed two water bottles and handed one to Jack before going back to sit behind his desk again. I'm gonna be brutally honest with you here. You're not too bad, a little reckless but not bad at all. You were obviously watching me and you even picked out the opening I gave you and you knew that it was a setup, even turned it to your advantage to boot. Ted said as Jack sat back and listened while he gingerly drank his water. If Jack was being completely honest, the praise he felt he was getting was a little much and again Jack found himself mentally lamenting over the state of his emotions because of his younger body. But as they say all good things do come to an end. That being said don't for one second think that the stunt you pulled wasn't reckless as all hell because it was. Had this been a real engagement and the person had been taking you seriously like I should have done, you would have been out when you pulled that fancy little dive roll, hell you wouldn't have even pulled it off. Don't get me wrong kid you have talent your strikes are strong, your aim is true, your guard is tight but loose, you're fast, and above all you pay attention. But, make no mistake you will not always be the fastest or strongest one out there, and if you misjudge it by even a second you, or worse one of the people you're trying to protect will be the one to pay the price. Ted lectured though it wasn't said unkindly. Jack had to viciously beat the voice at the back of his head that wanted to correct Ted and cite that once he had mastered one for all that he very well might be the fastest and strongest out in the field. But Jack didn't want to get another smack to the head. Not to mention he knew for a fact that he still might not be. He had no way of knowing how he would compare to the stronger fighters of this universe. Quickly the two started to outline again exactly what Jack knew in terms of fighting from street fighting, to Taekwondo, to Muay Thai, and then to traditional boxing. After going through the setup, they decided on how they would polish off his fighting abilities as well as adding on Sambo wrestling to give Jack grappling skills after Jack had explained to Ted that he had virtually no grappling or wrestling experience unless you counted backyard wrestling, 
which quickly led to Jack wanting to bury himself in a hole due to the laughter it brought out of Ted. The two wrapped up for the evening, and by that point, it was already pushing on around 6 o'clock at night, so Ted called out and ordered them grilled chicken sandwiches from a local place, and they both retired for the evening shortly after to start the following day with Jack's full training regimen. Gotham City Grants Gym September 8th so 6 Zosin EST FWP 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 This man is trying to kill me, my heart feels like it's gonna explode. Jack thought as he was going through his now third round of speed rope. Ted had woke him at 4.45 and immediately told him to get dressed. After getting dressed and out of his room they had gotten right into stretches and then a burst of speed rope to wake their bodies up. After that Ted had Jack going through body weight exercises at four sets of 15 and then after the sets were done he would be doing the same speed rope he was doing now. All in all the experience was introducing Jack to a new kind of physical hell. I'll say this much my stamina is gonna be through the roof by the time the six months are up if it doesn't kill me, Jack thought as he saw the timer ticking down from his five-minute round. As the buzzer went off Jack unceremoniously dropped the rope and proceeded to follow as he dropped to his knees, now trying to focus on steadying his breathing. This was only the beginning, as after this they would be picking a muscle group and focusing on weight training until 0645 and then Jack would be allowed to stretch to cool down and then he would have to shower and then put on his work uniform. Jack's cheek was a little swollen from the hit the day before, and now the rest of his body was throbbing right alongside his slightly bruised face as he finished collecting himself. As he was getting himself collected, he looked up to see Ted wrapping up his own speed rope set, and the man didn't even look like he was sweating. Jack was convinced he was doing that just to add insult to injury. Not bad kid, not great but not bad. Most people that ask me to train them personally crap out and don't finish that little routine we just did. So you're in the top 5% of people I've ever trained. Now remember today we're gonna focus on your back muscles for our lifting. So I'm going to have you doing three sets of 15 renegade rows, three sets of single arm dumbbell rows, and then you're going to finish it with three sets of 15 inverted rows to finish. After that we'll do our stretches again and then you can shower up and head downstairs to help open and set the place up. Ted said as he walked with Jack over to the dumbbell rack to pick up their individual sets to start the workout Jack using 15 pound dumbbells and Ted using 45s. The rest of that morning passed in a hazy blur of sweat, aches, and Ted calling over to Jack to keep pushing. Being young again had its perks like having the ridiculous boundless energy again that Jack had always had when he was that young. But even that, and having one for all buzzing at the back of his mind didn't change the fact that his 14-year-old body had never really lifted. The whole thing was making Jack feel inadequate if he was honest, but his face must have said it all as he finished the first set of all three exercises, as Ted had immediately told him not to get down on himself and to keep pushing forward. Jack was able to finish the workout with plenty of energy still in the tank, and if he was being honest he wasn't sure how to feel about that. Is that one for all backing me up or what? Jack thought as he re-racked his weights and went to shower and change out. After a quick shower and change and having some breakfast oatmeal, protein yogurt, and some fresh mixed berries Jack relocated downstairs and was introduced to the main staff member that he had always seen here working, a woman named Jenny Trask who not only ran the front desk in the mornings but was also a personal trainer here during the evenings. Jenny was about 5'5 with long dark red hair, a spotless complexion, a button nose, dark green eyes, and a slightly gaunt face. Her figure was that of a runner but mixed with somebody who definitely lifted though not enough to gain mass just the opposite. She was relatively cut. Overall Jack would have to say that the 22-year-old was definitely attractive, though if stood next to Selena or even Helena she would be kind of pale in comparison. If anything she gave Jack the Sarah Connor from T2 vibes because of her build. The rest of the day was spent in a great deal of monotony as Jack was introduced to his responsibilities throughout the gym by Jenny such as where to get cleaning supplies to replace what the customers would use like sanitary wipes. And he was then shown where to find what he would need to either clean the equipment, the bathrooms, or the hardwood floors. Of course Jack would see Ted every once in a while as he would come out of the office to check on the general comings and goings around the gym or to check on Jack himself. 
Around 12.30 Ted gave him his 30-minute lunch break and Jack had a turkey and cheese sandwich with some raw veggies mixed in. And while he was up in the apartment, he started a pot of ground chicken chili for him and Ted for dinner. After making his way back down and passing on the info about dinner to Ted so that he could keep an eye on it for about the next two hours to let the flavors permeate, Jack went about his normal routine through the gym, which if he was being honest was a little nuts. He almost felt like he wasn't doing anything at all as more often than not he would be with Jenny as she moved around the gym as now her replacement for the rest of the day for the front desk had come in. He found he enjoyed the lady's company and overall presence. She was kind but also firm and he would gather and put away equipment for her and the clients she was with. It was a little after 3.30 and Jack had just finished changing out back into a set of workout gear when he saw Ted talking to none other than Helena. Jack walked over just to say hello and wound up getting roped into another workout with the two, which then Ted told him that Helena would be joining them after for dinner. After another rousing set of speed rope, which Jack was now calling all speed ropes murder machines, the group of three proceeded to begin the bodyweight workouts from this morning, though Ted told Jack to take it slow in that respect and it gave Jack the chance to get the measure of Helena. After about a two minutes of the speed rope Helena was actually panting and wound up having to stop and catch her breath and Jack wasn't sure if he should feel bad that the murder machine was taking it out of someone other than him. Overall she held her own well, though it showed that her cardio was more based in quick movement, not prolonged activity. After the workout was over Helena excused herself to the woman's locker room to shower and change, and Jack did the same only going upstairs with Ted volunteering to shower downstairs. It was in Jack's personal opinion that Ted had only done that so that he could get out of setting the meal back up. After getting the chili pot back up and going again and setting bowls for all the fixins on the side Jack set the coffee table up for the three of them to sit down for a meal. If he were being honest the whole thing still felt absurdly surreal and Jack knew that it would be some time before he found himself on an even keel with his feelings about being in this new world with people that were once only fictional to him. Dinner turned out to be a rather subdued affair, though it wasn't necessarily a bad thing. Helena passed on compliments of the food as did Ted, and that left Jack happy. Conversation eventually as they were all finishing their dishes drifted toward schooling which again left Jack wanting to throw something at Ted's head. All I'm saying is, is that you should be worried about getting yourself your diploma, you need it to get places in life kid. Ted said with the infuriating smirk Jack had noticed he liked to wear when he was ribbing someone, mainly him. And I'll say it again when the time comes I'll apply to get my jed, but right now I'm more worried about making money and setting myself up a real bankroll. But I get where you're coming from and thanks again Ted for all of this. I know it can't be easy dealing with a new mouth to feed. Jack said as he tried to communicate once again how grateful he felt towards Ted while also trying to get Ted to change the conversation's course. Fortunately or unfortunately for Jack the conversation did slide though more in favor of Helena, as she decided to get a better understanding of the situation at large as she had yet to really pry about Jack at all since his appearance. Yeah, you know I've been meaning to ask about that old timer, Helena stated as she gestured toward Jack, making him wary of what she would say or even ask. I may be old, but I still kick your butt on a regular basis Missy, so you better watch it." Ted stated as he pointed back at Helena, though there was no real bite in his tone. Helena merely rolled her eyes with a slight grin on her face, obviously looking back on all the training she had done with Ted up to this point. Whatever. The point being here is who is this guy really? I mean he just showed up the other day and now he's started training under you and because of that you've got him living here sounds a little fishy to me. What is he your secret love child or something? Helena asked as she started to slightly waggle her eyebrows up and down at Ted trying to fish for any details. The question caught both men flat-footed, but immediately produced the same reaction from both of them as they started to laugh uproariously though Jack was laughing for the strange but familiar comparison causing Helena to shrink a little in embarrassment and quickly adopt a scowl as she crossed her arms looking at the two waiting for an answer. After catching his breath Ted took the lead and did his best to settle his other trainee down as she was looking close to having another of her classic loses of temper. Look, a buddy of mine from back in the day brought Jack here okay? He's his uncle and he can't watch over him unfortunately due to having such a busy schedule with his own job. 
so he asked me to look after this knucklehead. He also decided in his infinite wisdom to give the kid free reign to what he wants with his life. And while I disagree with the way he wants to go about his schooling the fact that he asked for a job shows he can be responsible. So long as he doesn't stiff me with the work he does, I'll back his decisions I'm not his dad just like I'm not yours. Anything else you want to know about it you're gonna have to ask Jack. Ted said as he glanced at Jack and saw that his face was contorting in what he could only assume was discomfort as being talked about while sitting right there. Helena sat back for a moment and then glanced in Jack's direction and gave a very vague apology in his direction before sitting quietly, obviously in thought. Jack found himself very confused by that reaction. As far as he was aware they had been amiable enough, though she did seem distant even then, and could only conclude that she didn't really want to bother getting invested with any attachments. Jack had to remind himself that this girl very well might just turn up as the new huntress sooner or later and he was still trying to decide how to handle that thought and what the possibilities brought with it. He was quickly brought out of his thoughts by Helena herself, though with a piece of information that he hadn't been expecting, and it gave him an idea as to just where he was. And while Jack had been suspicious as to just what earth he had been transported to, he hadn't wanted to assume. I'll tell you this much you're lucky. I hate having to waste time going to school, and the new house manager procured funding and just transferred me into the Gotham Academy. I hate it the place is ridiculous. I can't even wear what I want to I have to wear their stupid school uniform. I can already tell that the place is full of snobs. Helena stated as she leaned back more into her side of the one couch where she sat with Ted. Immediately upon hearing the school's name red flags flew up in Jack's mind telling him exactly where he could be though it now raised some very pertinent questions in Jack's mind. I think, I'm in the Young Justice verse, but if so what else is going to be different? Because Ted, Helena, and Dr. Occult were never mentioned at all. Gotham City Grants Gym September 191600 EST The days had flown by in a blur of training and a lot of planning between Jack and Ted and sure enough almost two weeks had gone by. The dinner the one night between Ted, Helena, and Jack having left its impression on our pseudo-young protagonist. It had left Jack missing home, but at the same time he found himself grateful for the companionship he had found, though the dinner had not repeated itself as of yet. Jack had gone ahead and taken the opportunity Ted had given him through the training of doing the local walks to get a lay of the area using it to go to various stores that were around and also to make local landmarks in his own mind so that he would be able to find his way around better on his own. Ted had conceded that Jack could easily use the GPS in his phone and most probably would, but that it would still be invaluable to know the city by his own sight, and Jack found that he couldn't countermand that argument so he had gone ahead with the training with no complaint. Ted had also been correct in his warnings, and Jack was kind of glad that Ted had decided to follow him for the walks after all, because already four separate people had made an attempt to jump him for whatever reason, though Ted had shut down each attempt quite handily. Spending this amount of time in the famed city of Gotham had showed Jack exactly what he had already expected to be the truth. The city was in fact a cesspool for crime. The paper and news feeds gave daily updates of how common it was and Jack more than once found himself lamenting over the fact of how easy it in fact should be to fix the issues with so many supers, and yet things continued ever onward as they were. Vexed wouldn't even begin to cover how Jack felt. Jack also found that as he started to pay more attention as he carried on with familiarizing himself with the city his earlier estimation of the city itself was in fact quite wrong. The city was in fact dirty. You just had to be in the right areas to see it. Getting a glance at some of the back and side alleyways in the neighborhood showed a relatively decent amount of trash and more than a few setups for homeless people. The second part always confusing and annoying to Jack because he had brought up the fact that there was the home Helena was staying in to Ted and he had asked if there were other homes. Apparently there were plenty of homes, just not enough for the population of Gotham. On the brighter side of things as a whole, though Jack could now easily navigate his way around a decent 2-3 mile radius from the gym, and know exactly where he was and the most optimal way to return to the gym. Even from the back alleys or rooftops thanks to the free running with Ted. Even though Jack himself would immediately admit that he was still no good with street names at all and had to rely on the landmarks he had chosen, 
He could say confidently that he would have a much harder time getting lost if things could continue on this trend. Thus far the workouts and diet that Ted had put Jack on were already showing results. Budding muscle size that Jack had not had when he was previously this age already showing themselves though only to a small degree. Though Jack knew it would only be a matter of time before they were extremely visible. Though he would be the first to say how annoying it was having to wait for the results to show themselves. And he often did, much to the annoyance of Ted. Which would only lead to more workouts. Which in the end would be just fine. Straight chicken and broccoli gets super bland. Jack lamented to himself as he walked up to the shared flat to change and get ready for the next sparring match that he and Ted were supposed to be having. Jack could honestly say that he had never eaten this much in his life, and it was driving him nuts because there was little variation. Ted had him eating a very healthy and high-protein yield diet and more often than not consisted of what he was about to have. Ted also had him eating almost every two and a half hours trying to keep him fueled for all that Ted had him doing between the workouts in the morning and evening, and just general work during the day. On top of the traversal exercises each day Ted had pushed Jack's reflexes, judgment, reaction time, fighting combinations, and strength all in equal measure, as they had fought both down in the gym and up in the flat. According to Ted, Jack's form was good, and though at the moment he wasn't the biggest his strength was in fact increasing and at a very acceptable level, and that wasn't even counting when Jack used one for all. When pushed Ted would say that most trained athletes at this point would be hard-pressed to match Jack. Jack and Ted had over the passing nights had at least one four-minute round where Jack would have to regulate his output of one for all, and be able to stand against the onslaught that Ted would throw at him, and he was expected to give back too. It was definitely an eye-opener for them both. Ted had marveled at the change any time Jack would shift from being seemingly normal to using one for all, noticing that it would increase his output of strength and speed by a factor of about three times. Jack would be almost as fast as Ted's friend Jay Garrick, moving at about 30% of his own maximum speed, and that alone seemed to give Ted pause when he brought it up to Jack as they discussed the fact that Jack was only still currently pushing it with one for all at 5%. Once again that thought had left Jack marveling at the possible full output once he had mastered using one for all. Though it had also left him a bit curious as he had yet to try and push beyond what he felt was 5% output. What would happen if he tried to just fire off a 25, 50, or even 100% charge? Really gotta contain that excitement lest I wind up with broken bones, Jack thought to himself. Most days Jack would wake feeling like a giant lump of bruised flesh and would immediately need to perform his stretching routine and take some Advil. He would then follow up with a shower and a homemade salve that Ted used for decreasing body pain. All in all things had been going well, and the most concerning thing to Jack at the moment believe it or not wasn't himself and his training but Dr. Occult. As it was that since Richard had departed from the gym, the first time Jack had not heard from him. Though that line of thought went flying out the proverbial window when Jack closed the door to the upstairs apartment and turned, to find said man sitting at the new cherry-colored dining table set that Jack had made Ted get, having a cup of coffee with Ted. Ah, our friend has finally decided to join us Ted. A colt said as he stood from his seat near the window and moved with confident steps to embrace Jack, who if he was going to voice it out loud, he would say how glad he was to see the man but settled for a brief hug. Jack knew for a fact that Richard dealt with the magical forces of the world, and that thought alone sometimes put a pit of dread in Jack's gut. As he knew for a fact after having checked some more newspapers that he was in fact in the Young Justice verse, or at the very least a variant of it, and that left the option for a couple of threats he knew of directly. The pictures he had found of the Dark Knight were scarce and very few were of a good quality, but it just so happened that the one he needed was the third one he had found when looking online. The picture was actually taken in the early hours of an evening while there was still some daylight and it showed not just Batman but Robin as well actually being thanked by the mayor of Gotham in what looked to be an unofficial capacity. And the picture itself was all the proof he had needed to show he was in the Young Justice verse. The configuration of both Batman's and Robin's uniform were exactly as he remembered them to be from the show. And once Jack had seen that he had started to look into the other sidekicks to try and make the comparisons to make sure that his hypothesis was correct. 
Shockingly, Jack found himself coming up empty for Kid Flash and Calderon Aqualad, but had actually found a few pictures of Green Arrow and Speedy and had found the same results as before seeing that the Archer duo's uniforms resembled what he remembered. I don't know when Roy gets kidnapped. Gotta decide how to handle that particular situation. Jack still had many doubts, the most prevalent being how to deal with the coming of future events while here. He was terribly afraid of causing too many ripples. Looking at the facts apparently the other young heroes had not made their debuts onto the hero scene in this version of the universe yet, which left Jack wondering if the timeline was on track or not. But having this knowledge also let Jack know that Watton and Clorian the Witch Boy were in fact major threats on Earth here and they were both in fact magical powerhouses. And that thought left Jack worried about a cult running afoul of either of them. The thought that one of his only contacts may have been fighting either of those monsters was ever so slightly disconcerting to Jack, and it must have shown because Richard seemed to pick up on his feelings. I'm alright Jack, really I am. I am very sorry that I haven't reached out to you since my departure, but I had some business that was pressing, and I also wanted to make sure and keep my word to you. Richard said as he broke the embrace and guided the young man to the table and started to regale him and Ted with the things he had been doing while he was away. You wouldn't believe some of the things I have to deal with these days you too. The demon activity in Los Angeles in particular has picked up exponentially, and things have been moving in a very aggressive direction. It's taking most of what I have on a daily basis to hold back the tide. Richard said as he had another sip of his own coffee. I've also had a run-in with a very interesting young man by the name of, Richard attempted to state as he placed his coffee mug back down only to be cut off by Jack. Constantine. John Constantine? Jack half-asked half-stated with a look of slight intrigue and yet apprehension. Ted sat and took in the look on his pseudo protege's face, and then took in the slight smile that bloomed on Richard's and came to the very simple conclusion that there was a lot more to this story than he was understanding at the moment. Okay, so are you two just gonna be cryptic or one of you chuckleheads wanna tell me what's going on and what the significance of this Constantine fella is, Ted said as he addressed the other two men. Jack leaned back and tucked his left hand under the crook of his right arm and started to rub his face while Richard crossed both of his arms and sat back with that same slight grin on his face. Ted could tell that Richard wasn't gonna budge so he turned his eyes and his full attention to his young ward and waited for him to explain the significance of this John character. Much to Ted's shock before the explanation came a very odd question past Jack's lips. How old is he? Jack asked in a slightly hushed tone as he now stared at the table while still holding his face. Richard's look of slight amusement didn't slip and he answered Jack's question immediately. He is 25 as of this past May. He and I had a nice little chat. He's just as arrogant as the memories you provided showed. But all in all he is rather clever, and he is just as skilled as you believed he would be as well. He has set himself up in Los Angeles for now to deal with some issues. He claims he has a bit of business there, so I imagine he may be there for some time. We vanquished the demons three together, just so you know. Though they won't be gone for long unfortunately. Richard stated as he finished his cup of coffee and stood up to get more. Jack became pensive and looked to be deep in thought, and as he seemed lost in his own head Ted stood and decided to heat up a portion of food for him, and when it was finished came back to the table with it for Jack who remained quiet but then began to pick slowly at the food. Richard had long since joined them back at the table though and now had a very large black leather bag propped against the left side of his seat. Okay so going back to it now does anybody want to tee me up here? Ted asked with just a slight bit of irritation as he glanced at the other two. Sighs John wasn't here. Or maybe it's that he was but was never mentioned. Or at least he wasn't in the form of this place that I can reference or remember. It gets annoying to think about. John's a lot of things, hero, conman, pain in the ass, take your pick he can be and is all of those things. He's like Richard in that he uses magic but not the same way. They even dress up pretty close too now that I think about it. That's the best and most simple way to describe John Constantine. Jack said as he continued to pick at his food. Ted could only nod and then the three of them slipped into a comfortable silence as they waited presumably for Jack to finish his food after all Richard had returned for Jack even though he himself hadn't realized it yet. 
Jack finished his food and then sat back with the still very pensive look on his face, almost as if he had too many thoughts going through his head. As Ted went to try and break him from his thoughts, he was beaten by Richard placing the black bag on the table in front of all three of them. The addition of said package was in fact actually enough to pull Jack out of his clearly troubled thoughts, as it was when he focused on the package his face split into a very large grin. Doc, are you serious? You got it already? I didn't think you'd have this until after I had all of my identity papers in hand at the very least. Jack said as he glanced at the package and gave the impression that he was doing his very best not to jump from his spot at the table and snatch the bag to open. Whether or not he was holding himself back due to manners or what have you could only be guessed at by the two older men, though they were both happy to see that their young compatriot was closer to how they had been used to seeing him. Seeing someone that looked that young, looking like they had the very world on their shoulders, was only one of the stark reminders to both men that Jack though looking as young as he did, was in fact far more worn than he or anyone should be. And who wouldn't be given the situation? Pulling himself from his own reverie of the state of his young friend, a cult smiled genially at the young dimensional traveler and pushed the bag slightly toward him. I told you that I would do everything I could to aid you. I am a man of my word my young friend, and I knew that not only did you want this piece of equipment, but that you would in fact need this particular piece sooner rather than later. After all, you'll need to practice with it to get yourself up to snuff with it. And I would very much like to have you as safe as humanly possible while out there fighting the good fight. I reached out to an old friend of mine by the way, and he was able to start putting together the rest of your attire including most of what you asked for in regards to your belt's extras though there were in fact a few pieces that will take some time to arrive. As you said when we planned all of this, we can consider this one suit alpha, so there will be room for improvement. But we can talk more about that later, at another time. Right now you should take a look at your gift, Richard said as he then gestured towards the bag laying in front of Jack. After Richard finished his little explanation Jack's eyes did in fact pan to the large black leather bag and the item inside it that he had asked for Richard to see if he could have custom made by someone. The fact that it was sitting here now. Jack could barely contain his giddiness, but at the same time took a deep breath to give this moment the reverence it deserved. He had hoped, prayed even that Richard would be able to get this for him, but he hadn't gotten his hopes too far up. After all the man had magic, but he actually was quite curious if he was able to have it made exactly as he had asked for. Just because Richard had magic didn't mean he just had the material lying around. Jack would be using this tool not only because of the obvious real-time applications, but because of where it came from and what it represented to him personally. Jack reached toward the bag and found the zipper on the side of the bag and drew on it until it had circled around to the opposite side of the bag, leaving Jack able to lift the one side like a flap, exposing his new support item and primary melee weapon. The shield gleamed under the lights above inside the apartment, the metallic sheen of the paint on the metal giving almost an ethereal glow. It looked exactly as he remembered, and it left Jack standing in more than just a little awe. It looked to be somewhere between 25 to 30 inches wide in total, the spacing between the concentric rings growing slightly larger out from center, where the white star gleamed between the palettes of the blue circle it sat in. The spacing between the red and white lines bleeding out from the center to the final red ring. Call me a cheeseball, call me a copycat, I really couldn't care less. Because this is undoubtedly the best decision I could have made when it comes to doing any of this, Jack thought as he placed his hands at the 3 and 9 o'clock position and hoisted the shield up out of the bag to then rotate it around and found the thick leather holds on the back. He saw what looked to be burned runes into the leather and smiled. Remembering one of the contingencies he and Richard had talked about, and the thought brought his eyes to a cult's as he placed his right arm through the holds to test the shield's weight on his arm. I pulled the memory directly and used that for the aesthetic looks of the shield. As you know unfortunately the compound it was made of does not exist here, but with that being said I was in fact able to come through on your request. I had to call in quite a few of the favors I was owed by a couple individuals, some of them I would have rather had on hold, but I know that this will be worth it seeing you hold it now. Richard said smiling as Jack took a step back from the table to test the balance of the shield as he began to turn from side to side while moving, testing the weight and balance of his new tool as it glided through the air on his arm. 
Jack began to move a bit seeing how it felt to move about holding it, knowing that he would need to begin practicing so he could use the shield to its fullest. Ted had remained quiet throughout the exchange, only taking a moment to put up Jack's dishes in the sink for him, and then had returned to his chair changing positions so that he could look at and address both Jack and Richard. Well it's a nice shield I'll give you that kid, but Rich what makes the thing so special? Knowing you and some of the things I've seen you do Emma imagine that it's for more than just protecting the kid. Ted said as he crossed his arms and leaned a bit back in his seat waiting for either of the two to answer his question. Richard continued with his small smirk and had closed his eyes almost seemingly lost in the memory of what had happened. Let's just say that getting it required some. Divine intervention. Flashback. Isle of the Masira Hephaestus's forge. September 8, 1130 asked. Smoke and fog covered the area in a thick haze. The light that existed in the space fluctuated tossing about as shadows shifted the movement in the room, staying at the typical pace common for here. Firelight, even the grandiose amount that existed down in this place, would always cast imperious shadows. They flickered and danced as if alive, and in their own way they were as they mirrored those who were moving about. The smell of sulfur and ash mixed with the smell of damp rock permeating everywhere hanging in the air and clinging to every surface. These smells mixing with the smells of cold steel and polishing oil, giving off something truly unique. The highly vaulted walls of the cavern could be seen leading ever upward until they reached their apex at the ceiling showing the various stalagmites hanging precariously above. The bottoms of the walls were properly molded into flat and polished surfaces, each one holding rows of weapons, armor, and even pieces that looked like polished caricatures of long past deeds of the ancient and fallen heroes of ancient Greece. The crackling of the fire of the deep forge was loud as the bellows magically stoked it every so often to keep it raging, as the sound of the hammers pounding an anvil rang out every single clap like a heartbeat beating in tempo echoing through the forge as bodies constantly moved in and out of the forge, and around the largest of the members of said forge. This man, or at least at first glance, this behemoth of what would be considered a man was pounding away at the largest anvil in the chasm-esque room, causing the cacophony of noise that radiated throughout the entirety of the workshop to seem whisper quiet in comparison. He could be seen standing with a slight hunch leaving him at about 5'8", though it would not be his height that would denote his greatness. The man was of a massive size his arms and forearms alike at the least two sizes bigger to that of a normal man with average exercise his shoulders and chest so broad that he could be considered the size of almost three men alone. He could be described as slightly bulky around the middle of his frame, maybe even portly, but it would not detract from the obvious strength he wielded as he slammed his massive blacksmith hammer at a molten piece of metal being held upon his anvil showering sparks in all direction. His head could be seen barely showing any sweat despite standing next to the blaze of his master forge, his dark locks peeled more toward the back of his head, showing that he was in the stages of going bald. The man's face was most definitely rugged denoted by a square jaw, a large crooked nose, his deep-set eyes gleaming coals of red focused as he let out a vicious snarl while focused on the task at hand as what meager sweat existed pulled at the bottom of his deep chin clinging to his light black stubble. One would think that the man would be heavily covered working in this environment as younger-looking men ran about carrying what looked to be ore, wood, and many other things such as equipment as the man worked diligently upon his latest craft. The room had many work tables and benches all finely crafted of a deep dark oak all beautifully stained. Many anvils lined sections off each wall showing that there were at least 18 other smiths all working on a piece of their own only adding to the noise of the forge. But, at the biggest anvil this was no mere man, and it left him the availability to wear only what he had on now, while his apprentices wore decently covering vestments. The man's wrapped sandals with a dark pair of metal greaves attached to his thick lower legs covering the front of his calves. The dark vambraces upon his arms shaking as he steadied his work, and the dark blacksmith's apron covering his meager and tattered cloth pants. The being's work attire all fitting in the border of the colors of black and an almost mud-brown, for what other colors could the god of fire, the forge, and craftsmanship the great Hephaestus need with flashy displays other than his own fine works. The god continued to hammer at the spearhead he was currently working on, molding it into its absolute shape for the maximum effect it would have death. 
bringing purpose to his craft through making weapons. Anything really was an art form, and it was Hephaestus's one true love. What is more beautiful than death? The memory sent a slight shiver down his spine. Hephaestus could still hear the words as if spoken only a moment ago, if he concentrated hard enough. And in some ways, in many ways Hades, the god of the underworld's words were of course right. He had seen his works and many lives, and in its own way it was beautiful, seeing something fulfill its purpose the way his wares did. Hephaestus could say with absolute certainty that when it came to his own weapons that was the only thing that he had ever heard Hades say that he could put any credence behind and apply to his own logic. Being who he was Hephaestus had crafted many a thing, and his weapons on their own were numerous still, and yet the vast number of them did not remove their splendor in his own eyes. Hephaestus treasured every single one of his works. Each of them were his children, and he treated them with the utmost of care, shaping them into what they were destined to be. Whether it be sword, spear, lance, arrow, or even a piece of armor Hephaestus took the utmost pride in his works. They were his legacy, and one of the only things that truly mattered. Though if he was honest, he was even beginning to take that same pride in the works of his apprentices, for they too were essentially his children. It had taken time, but having them here with him day in and day out had worn him down. Perhaps I'm going soft. As the years had passed there hadn't been many of them, but the few Amazons that were literally tasked with going out and finding a mate to produce further young women to join the ranks of the Amazons all had the same capacity as any other woman, and every once in a while a young pup would be born. The Amazons to this day did not truly care for man. Many transgressions had caused the hate that had festered in the hearts of the warrior women, and from that hate the barbarism that had given him his children had been born. It had gone on for years, decades even, and Wonder Woman the Princess Diana hadn't had a clue about the practice that had come to be to help maintain and replenish the ranks of the female warriors. She also had no idea how it was carried out, or how they had once treated the pups that would be born on the Messira. The blight of man cannot be allowed to touch these sacred shores Hephaestus could remember hearing the reasoning the Amazon queen had given when confronted by him, and it only stirred feelings of unrest in his old and weary heart. Things had changed, and the rift had been slightly healed in many ways yes, but the hate could still be seen if one looked closely. But again times had long since changed, and it had been many moons since that old barbaric removal practice had been carried out and because of its end Hephaestus had gained a family. And to think that he had been the one to put an end to it. He had never considered that a mortal's life would weigh upon his mind, and yet he had heard and seen enough. He had chosen to act and altered the course of many destinies. Make no mistake he had always had a family, but his fellow gods had retreated from the earth and very rarely, if ever, did they make an appearance. The fact of the matter was is that quite a few of them lacked physical bodies to even go about doing so now. Some being warriors had in fact fallen in battle facing threats to what had once been their own dominion over the earth, and in turn their essence would return to the throne room of Olympus where they could rest and celebrate their own divinity forever. Others had simply chosen to walk away. The realm of man had grown and many no longer believed in the Greek pantheon, even those of Greece itself barely practiced true worship of the gods anymore. Contrary to what many believed among the communities of the Homo Magi, the pantheon-based gods did not actually require belief to fuel themselves and give them their strength. It had simply become something that the gods had enjoyed. The fact stood, who would not want others to pray and make sacrifices in one's name? But the times had changed, and so had the gods of most pantheons. A great majority even from the other pantheons had deserted the earth and retired to their own realms to remain eternal, uncaring of the affairs of the mortals. Hephaestus himself had chosen a different road. He had seen it time and again. He had been here for too long to even fathom for most, which unfortunately came with the territory of being a god. Never aging, never falling ill, and watching the clock wind down and for all the change to see everything stay almost exactly the same. Being what he was even though he is in fact very much a man what could anyone say to him? He had enough, and he had barged into the Queen Hippolyta's throne room causing warriors to arm themselves only to wind up being told to stand down, for they would have stood no chance. He made it quite clear then that he would hear the screams of the so-called pups, no more as they were thrown to their deaths. 
the women of the Messira would raise the boys to the age of at least ten, and then the pups would belong to him. He would not allow another babe to be tossed to their death off of the cliffs to the waters below near his forge simply for being born. How many years had he heard the screams and done nothing? No, no more, never again. He had since then raised them all. They numbered almost in the hundreds now, and they kept him company and in turn he taught them how to ply the craft, to mold and to make. And believe it or not the queen herself had actually faced a turn and was grateful. He, his forge, and his boys had been responsible for many of the armaments that now dotted the Messira. The ability and willingness to craft with one's hands is a poetry that many he knew in the so-called modern world no longer possessed, at least not like him and his boys anyway, and the god was very proud of that fact. Hephaestus found himself pulled from his own recollection and thoughts as a portal of blue and white opened a few feet behind him in the forge and he quickly raised a hand to stall his boys from skewering his visitor as some were currently armed and quickly turned expecting an enemy. Yield, boys, go, take a break for now children, enjoy a spot of rest. I have a friend that seems to need something of me. Hephaestus said as he dipped the blade he had been working on to quench it and relieve it of its intense heat, before he set it back down on the anvil along with his hammer as he turned to address his guest. As soon as he lay eyes upon his visitor, he crossed his arms and adopted a slight scowl. Richard Occult coming to see him was something he hadn't anticipated, and he made that simple fact known to the sorcerer. He hadn't seen this man for years. For him to show up now would mean Hephaestus would probably wind up with a monumental headache soon enough. And just what can I do for you, Occult? It's been some time. Hephaestus rumbled in his deep dulcet tones as he observed the man who had come without announcing himself. The nerve of some mortals. At least the heroes of old would pray to us first to gain an audience. Greetings, mighty Hephaestus, it has indeed been a long time. Richard said as he clasped his hands in front of himself addressing the god of crafts bringing him out of his musings. Hephaestus was in no mood for the sorcerer's word play or trickery today and resolved to try and shake him up. After all, he was actually quite curious why this man had come. You should take heed, sorcerer, that the Amazons recovered a young girl with the ability to see the future recently and that they have brought her into the fold as a true Amazon. Should she have seen your coming here, and Queen Hippolyta Glean's word of it, she will be most displeased. Hephaestus stated as a small smirk adorned his face, though he could see that the sorcerer remained quite calm. The damned man didn't even bat an eye, much to the god's annoyance. He hadn't seen a mortal sweat from fear in a good while. It would have been a nice change, and he would have been sweating with good reason, for though things by the large majority had changed that did not mean that Queen Hippolyta wanted men visiting the Messira, especially unannounced. But this sorcerer had always been of a different sort, so Hephaestus really shouldn't have been at all surprised with his rather blasé attitude. I have no doubt of that Lord Hephaestus, but I can assure you the only ones who will know of our visit are you, I, and your boys," Richard stated as he tossed something at Hephaestus. With honed reflexes and a slight widening of the eye, the god of crafts caught the projectile and turned it up towards himself, only for them to widen slightly further realizing that what he was currently holding would be one of his own golden drachmas. Hephaestus pursed his lips and then glanced back up at the sorcerer and stared hard trying to glean why the man was here and now. It was not uncommon for mortals to be able to find one of a specific god's drachmas lying about, after all there were quite a few of them out in the world, if one knew where to look. But for this man who had five of them in reserve, three of them having actually been given by Hephaestus himself to said sorcerer in front of him, it left the god of crafts intrigued. He had expected the man to have come calling much sooner. Having the favor of a god was a unique opportunity after all. Possessing a golden drachmas was all well and good for any mortal. Gold was gold and the humans had even coined the phrase good as gold to further explain why a single drachmas would be quite valuable. A single golden drachmas was as large as two of those 50 cent pieces that the USA had once used combined, and that bit of raw gold alone would be worth a nice bit on its own for anyone. But to those with an affinity for the mystical arts, these little chips could be called in for a favor from the god whose chit you had, each one marked for the god it represented. And it just so happened that Richard Occult had exactly five under Hephaestus, and in so many years had never cashed in one. 
If he was being honest, he was slightly concerned about what the man would ask for. Well, you've certainly brought some intrigue my way, Richard, I'll give you that much. Go on, ask for your favor, but remember that I have the right to refuse if I deem that the request is not a viable one. Hephaestus said as he clenched his large fist causing the drachmas to disappear. The man stood quietly for a few moments and Hephaestus began to believe that the mortal had come without his request in mind, which honestly wouldn't surprise the god of crafts any. He had had quite a few dealings with this particular mortal, and if he was honest he liked him well enough for a simple man. But this one had a funny way about him and was seemingly quite forgetful sometimes. Just as Hephaestus was to speak to get him to hurry along as he had many things to do the sorcerer spoke. I give the one with a promise of two more, and in exchange I would ask you to make something for me. Richard stated as his eyes bore into Hephaestus's. The god would normally have balked at such a thing. Humans that did know of the ability to trade drachmas for favors were few, but the ones that did know and could in fact either face said god or summon their essence were even fewer. Of all of the ones Hephaestus himself knew of, a cult had in fact had many dealings with the Greek and even the Egyptian pantheon. He had asked for many things over time, and to his recollection through the minor gossip of his own pantheon, he knew for a fact that a cult had only been denied once before by any of the gods he'd asked something of. He may be facing that same rejection again, but Hephaestus would hear him out at the very least. The man had made him laugh on more than one occasion. Very well, Richard. You have my ear for the moment, let us not take too long with this. Speak plainly, Hephaestus said. I would ask you make a shield. I have a memory to use for its look. It is not for me but for a friend you see, a young man who shall soon be making quite a bit of mischief in this world we live in. I wish for him to be safe. I've had well I've had a vision. And if it is correct, that boy holds the key to fate of this world, of all worlds in his hands. The saddest part is that he doesn't even know it. He will need to be safe, and he will need to be strong. More so than anything else though he will need it because he will use it and the name he will bear to bring others courage and hope. Richard said as he extracted his left hand from within his coat pocket holding the other two drachmas he had already stated he'd part with. The sorcerer then followed up with something Hephaestus did not expect. Nerb h trough 8 htn latum, Richard said, and then a small show of golden light and sparks appeared and as it faded it deposited an oak chest four feet long, three feet deep, and three feet wide upon the floor in front of Hephaestus. He had understood it. He knew what he had said, but for the first time in a long time the god of crafts felt awestruck. Backward speech wasn't that difficult for someone of his own caliber to understand. Heedless of any possible trap and later on he would lament and criticize himself that he could have been easily duped in that moment Hephaestus opened the trunk to lay eyes upon exactly what he knew Richard had called for. NTH Metal The god of crafts had indeed worked on the metal twice before. It was exquisite and rare beyond measure. And yet, the man had actually brought NTH Metal with him here and now, and quite sizable amount of it and of all things he wanted of him, he wanted him to make a shield out of it. He wanted to ask the damn man where he got so much of it, but the truth was probably something the sorcerer wouldn't part with. The thought alone was already bringing a headache forth, but the chance was almost too good to pass up. So alright folks that's all for today. Stay tuned for part 3. Do subscribe, like and share for more such videos. Also check out the story and author Sajirox Tenkin on finfiction.net. Press the bell icon to be notified first on release. See you in the next video till then goodbye.